Söderlin. Erik Söderlin. Tack. Fantastiskt. Thank you so much. Classical guitar in combination with Beatles in jazzy in interpretation. Um, that was here, there and everywhere and then followed by Michel. I'm sure you know that. Good evening, it's wonderful to see so many here, um, so many familiar faces. I saw that outside right now, I can't see you at all, but that's fine. I know you are there, or do I? Uh, <laughs> depends on if you are simulated. I don't know, but it doesn't matter according to our keynote speaker. You're still real. Anyway, my name is Christus Sturmark. I am the CEO of the publishing house Fri Tanke. Very welcome to a dynamic exploration into the intersection of virtual reality, artificial intelligence and the philosophy of mind. This is a combination of topics that right now are redefining our understanding of what reality is our understanding of cognition and our understanding of the essence of hum human consciousness itself. We stand on the edge of a world where technology and philosophy converge, giving rise to questions, debates, deep worries and insights that once seemed to be the sole domain of science fiction. How do virtual reality technologies reshape our perception of what's real? And how does artificial intelligence challenge our concept of self-awareness and sentience? And how does the philosophical investigation of consciousness interact with these new advancements? So welcome to an evening of exploration of the real and the virtual, the human and the artificial, the conscious and the synthesized. At the first part, before the break, and after the keynote speech, we will have a panel discussion, discussion focusing on virtual reality and AI as a social, political and ethical issue, so to speak. And after the break, the panel will focus on AI and the philosophy of mind. Will superintelligent AI someday become self-aware? That's a big question and we can read a lot about it in the news all the time. But before these two panel discussions, I'd like to introduce to you our international guest and keynote speaker of tonight. He is Professor of Philosophy and Neural Science, co-director of the Center for Mind, Brain and Consciousness. <clears throat> He is known to have formulated the so-called hard problem of consciousness, the problem of how and why we have qualia, or subjective, the, uh, subjective phenomenal experience, um, like the experience that come with perception, like the redness of a rose, or the smell of uh, fresh coffee, or the feeling of love. And that is compared to the easy problem, in quotation marks, of course, uh, which is how the brain actually processes stimuli and, and makes decisions and produce behaviors and so on. That is considered the easy problem. Anyway, <laughs> his new book is called in English Reality Plus, in Swedish Virtuella Värdar, <clears throat> and it explores the philosophical consequences of virtual reality and augmented reality. And the central thesis in the book is that virtual reality is genuine reality and what that means to us. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor David Chalmers. Thank you so much, Krista, and thanks to, uh, to all of you for coming out tonight. It's such a great pleasure to be uh, here at this event, in effect, uh, marking the launch of this book in Swedish translation. When the book came out uh, in English in January last year, the world was in the middle of the Omicron crisis. So uh, 
the book launch at that time turned out to be, uh, turned out to be virtual. Now I, as you'll see, am actually a, uh, I'm a fan of, of the virtual. I think uh, the virtual can be, uh, can be wonderful in many respects. But there is still something special about an event here in person. So I'm glad that we get to uh, launch this, uh, this Swedish uh, translation of the book here uh, collectively together, embodied in person. Um, the theme of this book, or the genre of this book, is something I like to call techno-philosophy. It's not, it's not a mashup of music and dance and philosophy. Rather, it's a, uh, a two-way interaction between philosophy and technology. I'm myself a philosopher by training. Well, I started as a mathematician and a computer scientist. These days, I think about philosophy. But as a philosopher, you can think about uh, many topics. It's one of the wonderful things about the profession. If I'm interested in, I don't know, uh, baseball, I can work on the philosophy of, of baseball. Um, if I'm interested in uh, herring, I can work on the philosophy of herring. I don't know if anyone has founded this field yet. But um, if I'm interested in technology, I can think philosophically about technology. And that is one half of techno-philosophy. Thinking philosophically about technologies like artificial intelligence and virtual reality. The other half of techno-philosophy is using these technologies as a lens to focus on many of the great traditional problems of philosophy. So for example, I think that thinking about artificial intelligence uh, can actually tell us many things, can shed light on philosophical problems about the nature of the mind and the nature of consciousness. Thinking about virtual reality can shed light on many very traditional questions about reality itself. What is the nature of reality? How can we know anything about it? So, the, so, the, um, yeah, so this book is really an attempt to address many philosophical problems through the lens of technology, especially through the lens of virtual worlds, as the, as the title of the book in Swedish suggests, but also through the lens of artificial intelligence and other technologies. I mean, in many ways, philosophy, as I see it, is all about the interaction between the mind and the world. Well, there are philosophical problems about the mind. There are ph philosophical problems about reality, about the world, and philosophical problems about their interaction. What does technology have to bring to those? Well, we start, I guess, with the natural mind and the natural world. What technology does is gives us kind of a new case, potentially, of the mind and a new case of the world. So um, artificial intelligence potentially gives us artificial minds. We're gradually constructing systems, artificially, made of silicon, not of biology, but that seem to have many of the capacities of human minds. That raises the question, are artificial minds genuine minds? And in this book, I try to argue that the answer is yes. In principle, artificial minds can be genuine minds. And I'll get back to that in a second. Likewise, where worlds are concerned, you know, we really have one world here to deal with, the original, natural, physical world. But what virtual reality technology brings us is the possibility of artificial worlds, worlds that we create using computer technology. And one can raise a similar question about virtual worlds, about artificial worlds. Are art these artificial worlds, genuine worlds, 
is virtual reality, genuine reality. And as in the case of the mind in this book, I want to argue that, yeah, the, the answer is yes. Uh, virtual reality is, in principle, a kind of genuine reality. But let me start with the, uh, the case of the mind and AI and move on to the case of reality and VR. And the mind is where I got started in philosophy. My specialty is being a philosopher of the mind. And what drew me into this field from a very young age was the problem of consciousness. I mean, I started out as a studying math mathematics, physics, and computer science, and the problems there always seemed deep and interesting. But I would also think it would have been wonderful to have been a, uh, say, a physicist, a physicist three or four hundred years ago in the 17th century, at the time of Newton, when physics, say, the nature of space and time was utterly ill understood and to grapple with truly fundamental but truly mysterious questions. I mean, there are still many difficult questions in physics and mathematics, but there's a sense that we now at least have gotten the foundations. Where, and, you know, I would think, where, what are the problems which right now, what are the aspects of reality that we truly don't understand? And for me, it always came back to the question of consciousness. Consciousness is, in a way, the most familiar thing in the world. We all have subjective experience. It's like this multi-track movie in our minds. It's got visual experience, the experience of seeing the world around me. It's got auditory experience, as when we were hearing that marvelous guitar music a few minutes ago. It's got bodily experience, the experience of one's body. It's got emotional experience, feelings of joy or anger or sadness. It's got cognitive experience, the experience of, uh, of thinking or reasoning, of following a chain of thought. These are all subjectively experienced from the inside as part of our inner movie. These are all part of the stream of consciousness. And the question is, how does consciousness fit in to a physical world? What I've called the hard problem of consciousness is, yeah, how do physical processes in the brain, in the environment, give rise to conscious experience? Why doesn't all this go on in the dark somehow, without consciousness? Why aren't we what some philosophers have called zombies, creatures that, uh, that act and interact and behave in very impressive ways, but with no subjective experience? In a way, no one really knows the answers to those questions now. There has developed in recent decades a very robust science of consciousness, which is actually very active. I helped to found the Association for Scientific Study of Consciousness back in the 1990s, and it's having, it's having its 26th meeting in New York next month. Uh, the neuroscience, psychology, and philosophy of consciousness has become very robust, but still it's at the level of finding correlations, say correlations between processes in the brain and aspects of consciousness. Why is it that processing in the brain should actually give you subjective experience at all no one really knows the answer to that question. There are many, there are many speculations about this. I gather that uh, next week you have the philosopher Philip Goff visiting Stockholm, who's argued for panpsychism, the thesis that there's some more consciousness everywhere in nature. There are others who hold consciousness is an illusion. But right now, we don't have a solution to the hard problem. What we're finding, though, right now is one place where this problem is becoming very practical is the question of artificial intelligence, or AI. Because in recent years, AI has exploded. I did my own PhD thesis in an artificial intelligence lab. I worked with, uh, with Douglas Hofstadter, 
the author of Gödel Escher Bach and many other books, who's also worked closely with Christer. Um, but back, you know, back 30 years ago, human level artificial intelligence seemed very far off. I thought, you know, perhaps a century away. And if you'd asked me even 10 years ago, actually 2010, I wrote an article on AI where I said, well, what are the chances we'll get to human level intelligence anytime soon? I said, 50% chance we'll get to human level AI within the 21st century. But since 2010, all that has changed. You know, starting about 2012, there's been this massive resurgence of work on, uh, on neural networks getting larger and larger, more and more computational power, more and more data has led to so many advances, whether it's through, say, playing Go or discovering new scientific structures like protein structures or recognizing objects visually and uh, in recognizing speech. And most recently, over the last, say, four or five years, uh, large language models such as ChatGPT have really transformed artificial intelligence by showing signs of general intelligence. Uh, these models seem to be capable at, at very many things, initially developed for the study of language, um, for trying to get certain properties of syntax and semantics. These systems, which are just trained to predict the next word in a sequence of text, have developed very surprisingly all kinds of cognitive capacities that look like capacities for reasoning. I mean, they can carry on a conversation, they can write poems um, or stories, they can reason about mathematics or about science, they can play games, they can code. Um, they've developed all sorts of capacities and it doesn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. Every year, every, every, you know, every month, every week, there's new advances um, announced in this area. And this really has started to make this question very practical. Are these, uh, these AI systems conscious? Or may they be anytime soon? I mean, last year, famously, the Google engineer, Blake Lemoyne, said that he detected consciousness or sentience in one of the, uh, the Google language models, Lambda 2. And he argued that it was, in fact, conscious and it deserved rights and so on. Google immediately said, ah, there's no evidence that it's conscious, lots of evidence that it's not, and that before long, he was fired. But I think this it actually does raise a philosophical question. Is this system conscious? And actually, since, since then, I mean, we've had the release of one new system after another, most recently um, GPT-4, which is that much more impressive than, uh, than the systems that came before it, with all these capacities, and the question has suddenly become a real question. Is this system conscious? In, in, in this book, I argue that at least in principle, an AI system can be conscious. Uh, the system I actually, the case I concentrate on the most in the book is not a large language model. It's the case of a simulation of the brain. Just say we simulated our, uh, our brains perfectly neuron by neuron um, with that system, so that we had a system that behaved just like a human being, would it in fact be conscious? I've argued that a system like that could be conscious. If you, for example, uploaded your brain, replacing your neurons one at a time by silicon chips, as you know, there are, there are movies and TV shows where, uh, where this happened, happens, most recently one called, called Upload that uh, that uh, illustrates this process. I would argue that if you replace our neurons one at a time, say by silicon chips, if you're conscious at the beginning and the simulation is good enough, you'll have consciousness at the end. The all silicon system at the end would, could behave just like a human being and would in fact be conscious. That's to say, I've argued there's nothing special about biology when it comes to consciousness. You know, silicon, if biological neurons can do the job, so can silicon chips. What matters when it comes to consciousness is the information, is the computation. I mean, the whole question about large language models takes this even 
further. I think current large language models have some serious limitations when it comes to consciousness. Of course, they're not yet at the level of full-scale, human-level intelligence. Um, on the other hand, you know, my, most people think mice are conscious. Most people think mice have subjective experience, even though they don't have full-scale, human-level intelligence. I mean, the current pure language models, they lack sensory processing. So, arguably, so it seems likely they don't have visual experience, say, of the kind that we have. On the other hand, there are now multimodal models that process images as well as text. They may go beyond it. Current models, don't, they largely involve feed-forward processing without much in the way of memory. That may be a limitation when it comes to consciousness. There are questions as to whether these models really have robust world models. So I guess I'd say that right now I'm not confident that uh, if you asked me to bet, I would bet, OK, it's probably unlikely that current large language models are conscious. But the way things are going, AI is moving so fast, I think it's quite possible that within 10 years, we may well have systems which are, which are conscious um, and which begin to approach human-level intelligence. And that will raise all kinds of philosophical, ethical, political questions. Once we have AI systems which are conscious at the level of a human being with human level intelligence and so on, do they start to get, uh, do they start to get rights? Do they have moral value? I mean, would it be okay just to treat, right now we can treat our AI systems as tools because we don't think they're conscious, we don't think they're awake or sentient. They're merely computer programs, they're merely tools. Once they're conscious, I think all that changes. In the book, I argue that once you have AI systems with, uh, with consciousness. Consciousness is when you enter the circle of moral status. And that circle has been gradually expanding for many years. You know, first of all, it was just maybe uh, ourselves, our family, our tribes, maybe our, our country. Eventually, the moral circle expanded to include all of humanity, then it expanded beyond to include animals, most people think. Non-human animals have at least some claim not to suffer <coughs> gratuitously, and so on. AI is potentially the next step in that, uh, in that pathway. So I think very soon we're going to have to grapple with questions about morality um, that these AI systems raise. So yeah, once you accept that artificial minds can be genuine minds, then I think you know, a whole lot Begins, uh, begins to change. So a lot is going to turn on these philosophical questions about consciousness and about the mind. Let me turn now to questions about the world and about reality. Here the relevant technology is the technology of virtual reality, another technology which has been advancing fast in the last, uh, in the last few years. Um, I don't know how many of you have used a virtual reality headset, the, uh, the Meta Quest headset, formerly known as the, uh, the Oculus Quest, is perhaps the most well-known right now. You put on this, uh, this headset and you experience a virtual world all around you. Uh, Apple is said to be announcing a product, um, actually I think maybe just two or three weeks from now, scheduled for June 5th, is a speech that's said to be launching their own virtual reality headset, perhaps with elements of, um, of what people call augmented reality too, where you're in touch with physical reality and in touch with a digital, immersive, virtual reality. So this technology is, um, is moving fast and it raises so many philosophical questions. So, it, so the main thesis of this book is that uh, virtual reality is genuine reality, where a virtual reality is a computer-generated reality. Actually, a virtual world, uh, which is, I guess, the title of the Swedish version of this book, a virtual world is a computer-generated version which is interactive. When you play a standard video game on a two-dimensional screen, you're already typically interacting with a virtual world. It's computer-generated 
interactive. Once, you put on, once this goes into a virtual reality headset, you experience this world immersively in three dimensions all around you. Then that's full-scale virtual reality. And it raises so many philosophical questions. Um, one question is, could our own world be a virtual reality? Once you raise the possibility of this technology um, in which one is immersed, then the question gets raised, could a virtual reality be indistinguishable from physical reality? We're not, that, we're not there yet with the technology. Current virtual reality is fairly primitive and you know, cartoonish in various ways, but it's getting better all the time. Probably within decades, we'll have VR, which is indistinguishable from physical reality. At that point, it begins to ask, I mean, the question becomes natural. Could it be that we're actually in a virtual reality already? We'll be able to put people into VR headsets, which are indistinguishable from, um, from physical reality. Then, well, then the question just becomes very natural. Could that be happening to us? Could this be happening to you right now? I mean, you might say it's rather telling that you, have, you happen to be in a, going to a talk on the topic of virtual worlds. Is this something which the simulators just chose to... Uh, to, uh, to entertain you, uh, entertain you tonight. Um, this is the so-called simulation hypothesis, made famous by the Swedish philosopher Nick Bostrom, um, who actually argued that we should take seriously the, the thesis that we're in some kind of giant computer simulation. Um, after all, the as the technology gets better and better, these uh, simulations will become increasingly hard to difficult to distinguish from physical reality. Furthermore, it's quite likely that many such simulations may be created in the history of the cosmos. You start to ask, what are the odds that I'm one of the lucky ones who's one of the ones at level zero, unsimulated, when there are so many more simulated beings? Especially if you hold that beings, that a simulated brain could actually support consciousness, then you begin to ask, then you ask naturally, well, if there were to be a giant simulation of physical reality, I would have a simulated brain which could support consciousness just like that of an unsimulated brain, and you start to wonder, could this be happening to me? I don't say we are in a simulation, I'm not sure, but I do think it's a serious possibility, one that I talk about a lot uh, in this book. And one of the things that's interesting about this hypothesis for a philosopher is it's a way of raising many of the great questions about how we can know about reality, how we can know about the external world. Back in the 1640s, René Descartes argued in his Meditations on First Philosophy, he said, he raised the question, how can you know you're not being fooled by an evil demon into thinking there's this reality out there when none of it is real? You know, the modern version of that question is the, the question, how do you know you're not in a simulation? I mean, most famously illustrated in the movie The Matrix. How do you know you're not in the matrix right now? And once you've got this, you know, this actual simulation technology existing around us, this becomes very much, this is no longer science fiction. This becomes, well, it's no longer way out science fiction. It becomes near-term science fact, or science possibility at least. We can raise the question, yeah, could this be happening to us? Descartes and many people say that if we are in a simulation, then nothing is real, everything is an illusion. This is, where I, uh, this is where I want to depart, actually, from the philosophical tradition. It's where I think the philosophical tradition has got some things wrong. Um, the philosophical tradition holds that virtual reality would be second-class reality. If we're in the matrix, nothing is real. I want to allow, yes, we could be in a simulation right now, it's possible, but if we're in a simulation, nevertheless, things are genuinely real. Um, there are still, if, even if I'm in a simulation, I mean, it is, kind of, it is kind of telling that I can't actually see anybody out there right now. It might just be a, uh, might just be a rather local simulation of me and this table and this bottle and book and smartphone and so on, just to keep the, just to keep the computational costs down, guys. Is that what's, uh, what's going on right now? 
Um, but I would argue that even if I'm in that kind of simulation, the table is still real. The bottle is still real. The book is still real. The glass is still real. If I'm in a simulation, these are digital objects uh, with a level of computer processing lying underneath the bottle, the book, the glass. The glass is made of bits. It's a computer process. The water here is genuine water, but it turns out that water is digital. The water we've interacted with our whole life may turn out to be digital water. It's nonetheless real. It turns out that is, if we're in a simulation, that is the nature of our reality. So I want to argue if we're in a virtual reality, um, everything out there is still real. It's digital. I mean, there's a trend to regard, I mean, there was a trend in the past of thinking that if something is digital, it's not real. There's that famous phrase, IRL, in real life, where, where it's kind of assumed that if something is digital, it's not real life. One's digital life is not one's real life. One's real life is one's non-digital life. Maybe back in the 1990s when this phrase was coined, that rang, tr rang true, that digital life was not real life. I want to argue, though, that now, certainly I think in the age of totally ubiquitous internet, social media, cryptocurrency, virtual reality, AI, so much of our real lives is digital life. Digital life, digital objects are just as real as non-digital objects. So I would argue, so certainly if we're in a simulation, nonetheless, things are real. This, okay, the simulation idea may seem a bit science fiction-y to you and way out, but I think all of these morals also apply to real virtual reality, the kind of virtual reality that now you can experience in a headset, such as the, uh, the Meta Quest or the augmented reality to come. Many people feel that when you, when you live, when you interact in a virtual world, somehow it's an illusion, it's not real. I want to argue that the objects you experience inside, inside VR are perfectly real. When you play a game like Beat Saber, where you slice digital cubes with your digital lightsaber, you're interacting with real digital objects. They're genuine reality. They're merely digital reality. Now, digital reality is different from physical reality. Don't get me wrong. Um, the digital is different from the non-digital, but they're still both real. Um, digital processes make a difference in the world. So we should regard, in my view, we should regard the realities we're creating with virtual reality technologies as genuine realities, albeit digital realities. And in the book, I try and argue for this, uh, for this thesis in some depth. I argue that inside a virtual world, the ontology of these virtual worlds is of objects made of bits, analogous to what's sometimes called the it from bit hypothesis in modern physics, uh, that yeah, virtual objects are made of bits, they're digital objects, but they're no less real for that. This also, I think, has practical consequences. I mean, we are eventually, right now, virtual worlds, for many people, probably for most people, are entertainment. I mean, some people spend a lot of time in video game worlds, and some people indeed spend a lot of time in social virtual worlds, like, say, the world of Second Life has had an enormous number of people over the years. There are VR worlds, like VR chat, where people spend a lot of time. And the question raises, arises, can you actually have meaningful experiences in a virtual world? Can you, in, in principle, lead a valuable life in a virtual world? Or is it doomed just to be escapism? My own thesis is, in principle, you can lead a meaningful life in a virtual world. Already people have found this, I think, in virtual worlds like Second Life, where people have built communities, people build relationships, some people work there, some people find entertainment there. I recently watched a documentary called We Got Married in Virtual Reality about a, about a couple who met, actually, in, a, in VR and eventually got married out there in the... Uh, in the non-virtual world. I would argue that as conscious beings, we can you know, find meaning 
find meaning everywhere. The meaning in our world is the meaning we create with our consciousness. And we can bring meaning to virtual worlds just as we do to, uh, to non-virtual worlds. So in the future, as virtual worlds become more and more ubiquitous in our lives, they're going to be a place where we can actually find meaning. Now, this is not to say that virtual worlds are going to be, uh, to be wonderful. I suspect virtual reality will be you know, like the internet. Has the internet been wonderful? No. Has it been awful? No. I mean, it's been both. It's been both wonderful and it's been, it's been awful. There have been wonderful things brought about by the internet and there have been awful things brought about by the internet. I think the same is true for virtual reality. Uh, the fact that it's meaningful um, just raises the stakes. It means the good things will really be good, the bad things will really be bad. I mean, it brings on the positive side of the ledger, virtual worlds bring, I think, the possibility of new forms of embodiment, new forms of experience. Already, for example, you know, disabled people or aged people have had new forms of access to reality, to communities inside virtual worlds that they haven't had without, uh, they haven't had in the physical world. Um, I think there's the possibility, perhaps, of new forms of material equality and social justice inside virtual worlds as people experiment with new political systems. But there are also very obvious dangers and downsides from virtual worlds. Right now, most virtual worlds are ultimately controlled by corporations like Meta, like Google, and so on. And that seems likely to continue in the foreseeable future. Um, you know, there's a way in which the creators of a virtual world are like the gods of that world. They created the world. They've got enormous power over that world. So you know, do we want to live in a future where these corporations are our gods? It's already beginning to happen. But um, you know, the possibility of corporations controlling the very reality in which we live our lives is a very concerning one. I mean, I think we have to worry about issues about, if you think issues like privacy and manipulation are a big deal with existing social media, they're likely to be an even bigger deal in, uh, in VR. So I think there are enorm there's enormous potential and enormous upsides from virtual worlds, also enormous potential dangers and downsides from virtual worlds. Exactly the same is true for the technology of artificial intelligence. You can see through AI the, the possibility of technology that, you know, maybe super intelligent AI could have the capacity to solve the problems of climate change, to cure all known diseases, to figure out how we can have a stable and just society. But at the same time, yeah, super intelligent AI, can, it already shows, AI shows so many biases, but really, will people have equal access to AI, it's already got all kinds of, you know, potential. AI will have so much power in the hands of corporations, so much potential for harm. There's, in the extreme case, there's the possibility that AI systems could actually, you know, take over, and if not properly controlled, could lead to, you know, what people call existential risks, the death of humanity. So I'd say that, you know, the stakes here are very high, um, both for AI and virtual reality. The fact that artificial minds may be genuine minds, the fact that virtual worlds may be genuine worlds just raise the stakes here. They're fascinating philosophically, but these are cases where the philosophical problems may also have great practical import. In the long run, we're going to have to figure out many questions about consciousness, about the nature of reality, about how to live a meaningful life, about how to set up a stable and just society in order to make sense of life in a world with these technologies. I hope that at the same time, working with these technologies is going to help us shed light on these very broad philosophical questions, which are also of the greatest practical import. So the way I, I summarize all this in a slogan is, yeah, artificial minds are genuine minds. Virtual reality is genuine reality. The rest is up to us. Thank you.
Thank you, David. <laughs> Extremely interesting. Please sit down, actually, there, because uh, uh, now I'm going to invite two more guests up on stage to discuss. Yes, we'll take these away. Thank you. And uh, extremely interesting uh, to hear you talk about this, uh, David. Um, I've asked two other thinkers and researchers to join us to discuss David's um, presentation here. Um, the first guest is a professor of scientific visualization and the director of the Wallenberg AI, Autonomous Systems and Software Program, also called WASP. Please welcome Anders Schindemann. <laughs> Please sit down, Anders. And um, my second guest from Stanford University. He is an interdisciplinary ethics fellow there, working on the moral and political philosophy of artificial intelligence. Please welcome Henry Kugelberg. <laughs> okay, first of all, um, uh, Anders, you, you, you are leading the, the project WASP. Mm. Um, that I, I'm just thinking of Lisbeth Salander's <laughs> hacker network in the Millennium Series. Right. That's the same name, but I guess you do other stuff there. What, what, what is WASP? Uh, WASP is um, by far the largest research program ever in the history of Sweden, mm. funded by the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. Mm. Um, it's a national program, uh, and we have the amazing sum of about six billion Swedish kroners until 2031 to graduate about 600 PhDs uh, on the national level, and I would say more than 400 of them are experts on AI. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge effort that goes into that program. Fantastic. Do you think that can put Swedish sort of in the research front on the, in this field, or are we forever behind China? <laughs> It's a, an extremely fast-moving field in yeah. the world, right? Uh, but I think we put Sweden on the map. Uh, I think we put Sweden in a position to have a voice in the very important work that's going on right now in terms of developing regulatory frameworks at the European level. We have our own, for the first time, we have our own Swedish uh, language model, the GPT-3 model that we trained on one of the supercomputers in, in, the, in the WASP family. So I think we have, we have a, a lot of things that we have done to... I would say not only catch up, but also be an important player at the international level. Mm. That sounds great. Uh, Hendrik, before we go into to discuss David's um, keynote speech, can you just explain to us what is the moral and political philosophy of AI? That's, that's what you do research on. What is that? So it's a, it's a great question. Dave brought up some of the, those issues. The kind of wider the social issues are related to the wider infrastructure, the wider system that kind of we see these technologies being built in. The political issues, I think, are numerous. So all kinds of questions related to the biases these systems have, mm. how we should mitigate those biases, if and when it's permissible to outsource human decision-making to artificial decision-making. Mm. So if a bureaucratic uh, machinery can use AI systems to make decisions. So all kinds of questions like this. Mm. Okay, extremely interesting. That's, that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, le let me ask you, uh, Anders, first. Um, just what is your reflections on what, uh, what you heard from David here? What kind of ideas and thoughts came to your mind? Well, you know, it, it's, it's amazing to listen. I also had the privilege to, re to read the book. And, uh, and it's amazing to be taken on such a journey through philosophy and with my own background in physics and connecting philosophy to physics and you know with all the references to science fiction that we all grew up on as well and, and it sort of it brings back memories of reading Gödel Escherbach and yeah. Roger Penrose, The Emperor's Mind. So yeah. It's really in that spirit so I mm -hmm. thoroughly enjoyed uh, both the presentation and the book. That's wonderful to hear and I know that you were also a candidate for being the first astronaut in Sweden but 
You didn't take that. It was Christy Fugler's song. No, he but you came close. No, he, he was better. And he was, you know, <laughs> yeah, so, but, but I do fly virtually in space now. Do you have? Yeah, I do. I do. Okay. <laughs> in, in what kind of system? You know, we build, we're building dome theaters. Uh, and maybe you've seen just uh, on yeah. the other side here, uh, a Techniska Museum. We're building a big dome theater. Yeah. Uh, and we have a piece of software that we call Open Space which is actually a, a virtual tour of the whole universe. We can fly from centimeter resolution on Earth all the way out to Big Bang, 13.8 wow. billion light years out, and opening up in December. Uh, so everyone's invited to come there, and I will be there to talk about the universe. That's wonderful. And that, according to David, is real. So don't be of course, too yeah, sad I mean, just you at didn't. The, there's a restaurant at the end of the universe, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> Hendrik, what, what came to your mind during this speech? No, so I also had the great privilege of reading the book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I also uh, I appreciated that you kind of touched on some of these more social and political questions at the end. I think they go very deep. I think it's a, the kind of techno-philosophy approach that you lay out. I think that can't abstract away from who will be the most likely actors to build these kinds of systems. Um, and as you said, already the social media companies set the terms for our democratic deliberations to some extent. And if they would have the power to, or if we would spend basically all our lives on there, then in a sense they would set the terms for all of our everyday interactions, for how we, when we kind of go for coffee with a friend, when we call our grandma. And of course that would be a tremendous power to have and it would come with, I think, very, very worrying implications for uh, broader society, so I think that was yeah. that was very good. But can, can I ask you, David? I mean, if you if we skip the question of where, whether we are all in a simulation for now, at least, uh, and just talk about uh, virtual worlds that already exist that you can go in and interact with other people online, uh, if if those worlds are real in the sense that you sort of argue for, would you say that? if I steal something from you, my avatar steals something from your avatar in that world, should I be prosecuted not only in, in that virtual world, but also in the real world for doing that? It's a great question. And actually, courts have begun to address this question really? already. I think there was a case in the Netherlands, um, maybe three or four years ago now, involving a game. Maybe it was RuneScape, where somebody stole within the, uh, the virtual world some kind of treasure that someone had been to a lot of trouble to, uh, to acquire. And I can't remember what happened, whether it was a, a civil case, maybe a lawsuit where they were sued for some form of theft. And the, the court found that this was actually a case of, um, of theft. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, I think the, the perpetrator argued that, come on, this couldn't really be theft because there's, no there's no real object there. There was mm -hmm. nothing to... Uh, nothing to steal, it all happened inside this fiction. And so I think the court found that somehow that a real digital object was stolen and this person should be held responsible and maybe compensate the, uh, uh, the previous, previous owner. So I think this, you know, this kind of just resonates with the idea that what goes on in these virtual worlds is real and on a par. I mean, and maybe even more seriously, there are, you know, there are assaults, um, people experience the equivalent of sexual assault inside virtual worlds, and yeah. it's, it's really quite traumatic for people who uh, who undergo it. And I think there's, you know, the sense is not that this is um, that this is merely a, a fiction. The sense is this is something that really happened. And now it's got to the point where now when Meta, for example, builds their virtual worlds, they have the um, every avatar has something like by default a four foot boundary around it, so that people can't enter other people's personal space. So I think this is bringing out that, yeah, even if, the, uh, even if these are digital worlds, these are real conscious beings that people are happening to, and what happens inside a virtual world is real. But I'm thinking, shouldn't, shouldn't sort of the, the, the punishment for doing a crime be in the virtual world then? Because otherwise, you sort of mix these worlds. I mean, you could imagine that if you steal something in the virtual world, you would go to prison in the virtual world, which means you can't play this for a year. 
there are, yeah, there are practical problems with making that work, right? Okay. Someone can always take off the headset, right? Yeah. <laughs> so how much of an incentive is this kind of punishment going to be? Okay, we're going to send you to the virtual prison. <laughs> well, okay, what do you do? You, uh, you log out of the virtual world, you re-enter as a new character. Yeah, or, yeah. Okay, so it's, it's yeah. probably not going to be a, a very great incentive for now. So at least for now, I think laws of the non-virtual it is very important that out in, the, out in base reality, we have laws which apply to what mm. happens in the virtual world. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Anders, uh, with your background in physics, uh, how does it resonate for you to say that the virtual world, in a, from a philosophical point of view, really is real? It sounds like mathematical Platonism in a sense, but applied to VR. What do you think about it? Well, you know, f from my perspective, uh, having gone through a couple of waves of uh, virtual reality hype and uh, being disappointed yeah. over and over again and the sort of limitations of the technology, yes, we are getting better, but um, we are still not there. We're orders of magnitude away from, from doing real virtual reality and the notion that Dave is talking about in terms of a perfect uh, virtual reality setup. So we're not there. But, but quite soon. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, okay. There, there are some really fundamental limitations, uh, and you know, uh, yes, if we connect straight into the brain, you know, with, with brain interfaces, and then we might get there. But there are some other, other very fundamental limitations in terms of the laws of physics and and how we can simulate the, the virtual world. And that I, coming from a physics point of view, uh, and and that's also mentioned in the book about the limitations of how much energy do we actually have in the universe? Uh, can we can we really simulate the universe within the universe? The second law of thermodynamics, mm. the entropy in the system, all of those things. Does it really make sense to have a global simulation that's mimicking the real world? Can we do that? All of those limitations are going through in my head as a physicist and looking at quantum entanglement and all of those things as well. Yeah. Uh, hmm. so, so those are limitations. But addressing your question, I think really what I think about the virtual reality nature is if we sort of put aside the technical development for a second and look at what is it that is creating that notion of immersion and presence for a human being. And, and I think you can accomplish that with other means that are not necessarily as technologically advanced. Uh, I mean, you can get immersed in simple media like a book, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and the narrative and the agency become so important in that. So that's a, actually a question I have. Would you consider the characters in the book as being real just because you, we would perceive that as being very engaged with those characters? Are they real as well? That's interesting. Do the characters inside a novel have the kind of causal powers that we do? Inside a virtual world, you know, we got not just we can do one thing, we can actually right. do many things, and that's very important to things being real. We've got multiple choices, things can be simulated in multiple ways. In a book, you know, it's mostly as if the characters are kind of moving down one path, so I'm not sure they have the genuine causal powers that uh, people do in a simulated virtual world. On the other hand, maybe, how about an interactive novel? Yeah. Where, but, uh, where, but this where is where people get to go down different yeah. pathways. Yeah, but, but there is the notion of agency that yeah. you don't talk very much about that in the book. So what's the role of agency for these characters, and how important is that? Yeah, you know, I really, I, the next chapter I would have written if I had had the book is already rather <laughs> thick, you can see. But right. basically, everyone is kind of focused on a different philosophical theme. Some are knowledge, some are reality, some are value. If I had one more one more chapter, it would have been on free will. Okay. And I wish I'd written that chapter, actually, because it's so relevant here. It's actually relevant to many of the ethical and political issues in existing virtual worlds. If you're mm -hmm. constantly being manipulated by these corporations who control the world, do we have genuine agency or genuine free will? I mean, some people have argued, the philosopher Robert Nozick argued that we should not enter certain kinds. He talked about entering an experience machine where everything would be wonderful, you'd have great experiences of being the best in the world, in your field, and so on. But uh, he said you shouldn't enter this experience machine because nothing is real. And I think his central argument, his central consideration was you would not have genuine agency, you don't have genuine free will, you'd just be living out life according to a script. And so I think for a meaningful life, we're not just living out a script, we have to make choices. As you say, we have to have agency. I would argue we can have that in a virtual world, even if I enter now into, say, Second Life or the world of 
of say uh, of Minecraft or something, mm -hmm. I can I can make choices. I can interact with some people and not with other people. It's still up to me. Um, I have agency. Now, does a character in a book, if I'm reading the book, do those words on the page have agency? Is there, there's a fiction where they have agency, but I would say they only have agency in the fiction. But in some sense, in, in your imagination, I mean, you're there. You can dream, yeah. dream about the characters and you can interact with them. They become real. They get their own life, right? You're right. Dreams yeah. are interesting. And you know, yeah. dreams are like little, little virtual worlds that we run ourselves yeah. on, our, uh, on our brains. Uh, every night, and they're a little bit like virtual worlds. I mean, they're much more fragmented, and uh, you know, they're also created by us, so they're not out there independent of us in the way that a virtual world is. But a dream is an interest. You might also argue that when the author writes the book, in their imagination, they're, they're conjuring up so many scenarios that, uh, that it could well be that in the author's imagination, there's a kind of, kind of virtual reality. So I agree there's a kind of a spectrum of reality here. Can I ask you, I mean, <clears throat> Uh, when the virtual reality systems that you can, as a consumer, buy to, to your home, when they get better and better, do you think, Hendrik, do you think that there is any risk that it will have mental effects on you? I mean, if you, if you, live, if you go into these worlds for hours and hours and uh, experience things, did you see any problem with that? It's a genuinely, that's a genuinely interesting question. I guess it depends on how good they are, right? So if they are truly indistinguishable from reality, then presumably it would just be as if we are in reality. So I guess... But it, I mean, but still... Kind of, when we're moving mm. towards that... Mm. Uh, so I don't know, so I don't know what about the latest statistics about how bad or good it is to play too many video games or whatever. But surely it's, to me, as a non-psychologist, kind of doing some hobby psychology, does seem to be worrying if we're mm. kind of... Well, so I guess the kind of definition would be if we're leaving, if we're not kind of fulfilling our duties in the normal world, then that looks as if it's a problem. Because, I mean, those systems can already uh, uh, sort of over take over your, your impulses, emotional impulses. I mean, I don't know if any of you have tried this, this VR thing where you, you're on the top, on the roof of a skyscraper in New York, and there is this plank, plank, yeah that you <laughs> walk out on. I've done this. Uh, and you walk through the room, uh, you, in, you're in a room, but you have this helmet on, and you walk out on this planka, and you see the, the cars down, uh, the, down there, long, long down there, and when you walk, and then the, the plank ends. And I couldn't force myself to walk over that line. I could not, even though I completely intellectually, of course, knew that it was not a problem, and I couldn't do it. Uh, so in that sense, it already takes over your, your em emotions. Um, can this be dangerous, do you think, David? It's interesting, actually. The first time I ever did this, I just... You have yeah, tried it. I stepped off the plane very gingerly and said, okay, <laughs> the floor is still there, and I went there, and okay, it's okay. Now I walk on air. But then I tried the other one, Richie's Plank Experience, which, is which, which you actually get on the quest. Then you step off the plank, and they're very cruel. When you step off the plank, you tumble. <laughs> <laughs> you tumble down. You fall, to the, you fall from the skyscraper down to the ground. Only in the virtual world. Yeah, yeah. And you're, you're still fine. In the, uh, but it's a rather <sighs> cruel experience. To, I'm sweating to go just through. thinking about this. It's really uh, scary to do this. Is it dangerous? I mean, just say, for example, you get. People worry about, for example, transfer. Just say, uh, you know, you get used to stepping off planks in virtual worlds and you realize that it's, uh, that it's totally fine. So just say now you start stepping off planks in the, uh, in the physical world, you'll get in a lot of trouble. It seems that people actually don't transfer terribly much from uh, one reality to the other. But I think it's really vitally important that when you're in VR, it's always very clear that you're in VR. Mm. And when you're not in VR, it's always very clear that you're not in VR. I mean, right now, it's, always, it's usually pretty obvious. So we perceive VR as virtual. As it gets better and better, it might get harder to distinguish. I think it's going to be very important. There's always going to be some kind of marker there. Yeah, but it, you know. and it also seems to be very individual how you react on that. I, my 13-year-old son did the same thing. He just walked. He didn't care at all. <laughs> okay, that's right, yeah. It's extremely different reaction from me. Kids find it, by the way, totally obvious, I think, that uh, <laughs> virtual reality is genuine reality. They're used to hanging out <laughs> in these virtual worlds. And yeah. yeah, of course it's real. 
And it's, I mean, it's, it's related to some of the points you made earlier that certain kinds of experiences in VR could be as traumatic, presumably, as experiences in, uh, in the real world. So in that sense, the question maybe isn't, is it bad or traumatic to be there? It depends on what kinds of things people get up to when they are in VR, just as, you know, same as what they do in the non-virtual reality. You know, uh, w one of my favorite science fiction books, I, d I don't think you referenced this mm. one, it's The, the Red Dwarf, uh, mm. uh, the British uh, science, science fiction television series that was turned into a book. There is a computer game in that book, and it's called BTL. It stands for Better Than Life. <laughs> and, and, and the problem with the BTL game is that it's so good that no one ever wants to leave mm. the game. So they actually starve to death <laughs> in, in the real world. Uh, and it's, it's sort of a, a comedy because, you know, there's this green exit sign in the virtual world that you can say exit all the time, but no one ever wants to exit, right? So they get stuck in a black hole uh, sitting there. So it's, it's kind of funny. That could, yeah. that could be a problem if people yeah. <laughs> spend, rather spend the time in VR. I, I actually called my first uh, visualization laboratory BTL. <laughs> be better than life. <laughs> That's another version of Reality Plus, I right. guess. Life Plus. But, Hendrik, um, I mean, we, we, we will wait until after the break to talk about whether AI can be conscious or not, but I think we all agree that they will behave like they're being conscious long before they, if and when they actually get conscious. I mean, they will, they, people will react to them as if they are conscious. Do you think that this will create a lot of, um, what you call it, m moral movements, saying, oh, we cannot treat them like this? I mean, even long before they, they eventually get uh, conscious. It's, will that be a problem? Well, so I think you're right that people will, I mean, already I think people treat them, if not as conscious agents, but mm. at least as if they are agents, so they have and I think that's one of the problems with this kind of technology, with the kind of the way the chat interface is set up. It's set up in such a way that we are, should be made to believe that this is an agent we're interacting with mm -hmm. and that the answer it gives us has a kind of authority. And of course, oftentimes the answers does have a certain kind of authority, but it isn't really responding to us as an agent. I mean, one example of this, so I saw someone there's this debate in universities about cheating using these systems, right? Yeah. And someone said, oh, I have a perfect workaround to this. I just paste the essay into the chat box and ask, did you write this uh, essay? And so they ask the GPT-3, did you, did you write the essay? And it says, yes, I did. But of course, it doesn't have any way of knowing if it did. So it, that is kind of treating it as if it is an agent, but it actually isn't. If people, well, it's an interesting question, what kinds of things will follow kind of uh, from what, what sort of reaction, reactions people will have. I guess we've already seen, uh, so Blake Lemoyne, for instance, he is, yeah. I guess, advocating for, really, like, I, I'm, I'm not, I can't remember exactly how he put it, but some sort of rights, I think, he argued uh, for giving to the Google's, Google's AI system. So uh, in a sense, I guess it's already happening. Yeah. Um, which is, I think it's a natural response to this part of, I mean, when we have this kind of empathetic impulse to something. I think it's a natural response to want to treat it with dignity and respect and these kinds of things. Uh, and I guess that isn't as much of a problem as the sort of negative things we could use these systems for. So I'm not so worried about people advocating for rights. I'm more worried about people using these systems for, for bad purposes. And what, what could that be? I mean, anyone here, what do you think, what, what problems will we see in the near future coming from AI and VR use? Henrik is the expert. Well, <laughs> I, I, well, I think the f one of the fundamental problems is just the ability to process an incredible amount of data in a very short time. So, mm. I mean, if we abstract away from the, we can move away from the kind of natural language processing, large language model systems, just the machine learning in general, I think, can take data points that before just looked like random data points scattered about a person and form a very coherent picture of this person, uh, all kinds of things. And then you could use it to kind of manipulate us in all kinds of ways. So that is a worry way before these systems become conscious. It's a worry uh, that states should have this power. Uh, it's a worry that private corporations should have this power. 
Um, and the question is, I mean, I think it's an open question what they will use it for, but the fact that they have this power is, is worrying in itself, even if they never use it, just that they have this. So in political philosophy, there is this idea that even just someone having this kind of power over you and they're never deploying it is still kind of dominating in an objectional way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, we've already had a few years now of uh, AI algorithm curating content on, in social media, on Facebook and so on, curating content individually, so, so you get this kind of news that sort of is right for you. Uh, and, uh, and we know what that led us to. It led us to Brexit, it led us to Donald Trump be winning the election, it led us to a lot of... Um, conspiracy theories, thriving on the internet and so on. And I'm thinking very soon we will have not only AI curation, we will have AI create, creation of content as well. Because during these years, it, or the, the content was at least created by humans, it, but it was curated by AI. Now AI will do both. Uh, and I guess it will produce content a million times faster than troll fabrics and humans can do. What, how do you think about that? What are the consequences? Well, just wait, just wait until the people you encounter on the internet are <laughs> largely AI systems. I mean, it already happens, exactly. right? There are a lot of, lot of bots yeah. out there, but wait till those bots get to, uh, get to human level intelligence and you know, wait till basically everyone, every second person you encounter, say in a virtual world, is, uh, is themselves an AI creature. I do think it's gonna be very important that we always know when we're interacting with AI systems and when we're interacting with, um, with humans. But how but, can we know that? Well, I think we're going to have to, you know, people are going to, <laughs> people are going to, I think, demand mechanisms by which we can know. We should always demand that, you know, when you're in VR, there's a flag you're in VR. We should demand that when you're interacting with an AI, there's a flag that you're in AI. But I do think that probably, I mean, not everyone, I mean, likewise for, I mean, the corporations are going to control so much of these worlds that, you know, we're used to having a news feed that's cultivated by a corporation. Wait till the whole world around us is cultivated by a corporation. It may well be that you'll be able to pay for, you know, to enter a virtual world that's relatively free of manipulation, where all the people you encounter are guaranteed to be humans, except in special cases where you always know what's what. But you'll probably have to pay for that. There is always going to be free, just as there's free social media, there's going to be free virtual worlds, but you know what they say, when it's free, that means, uh, that means you're the product. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like in, in the, you know, the free worlds are going to be precisely the ones in which you're going to be manipulated and which you're not going to know. But if, if we all live in, in a simulated world, does it matter whether it's an AI you interact with or a human? Well, it depends on, like, if the AI is a genuine autonomous <laughs> AI that's, uh, that's behaving of its own free will, then I would argue in principle, you know, you can have very meaningful interactions with an AI. But if this AI is just a creation of a corporation put there to manipulate you in, in certain directions or a political party or whatever, then no. Yeah, if, I, if I can g give a view on, on, uh, on the AI perspective, I think that uh, from, from my point of view, I'm less afraid of the development of the AI itself, but more of the general availability of the data. And, uh, and so I would, the debate out there is about you know, the fear of uh, general intelligence, artificial intelligence, but I think it's, it's the data that is, in, uh, is available to that AI is the scary part. And, mm -hmm. and the sort of the lack of transparency and openness about some of these AI methods that are being developed. And if you look at the, the sort of the generative AI that's taking off at this, uh, this time now, I think that's where we are seeing the, the, the really big disruptive change. Uh, and we humans, we have to get really get used to the fact that we, we don't have the, we don't have the monopoly anymore. Uh, some of those things that we have seen as uh, genuinely human qualities will be transferred. But that has happened in the past as well. Uh, in mm. other technologies, has been disruptive in the same manner as generative AI is at this point. Mm. But it, it's fundamentally going to change many ways in human life. I'm thinking, I mean, it, ha it has to be regulated some, some way. I know that this big uh, G7 meeting in Hiroshima right now uh, are discussing regulations for this. But I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, of course, the sort of serious, uh, honest uh, 
states will follow that, but there is a lot of other states out there who doesn't really care about that. So, Hendrik, I mean, what, what's the solution to this? You're the one who's researching this. Yeah, no, I, I think it's... I think the, I, the only thing we can do is to come up with very good regulation and then try to export it as well. I mean, mm. I think I, I agree with you. It's a genuinely hard... I think the EU is, is the place to start. I think the EU has already done some good, good things in this domain. Uh, I think the EU AI Act is a good start. Um, the US has its own problems with getting regulation through kind of in the political systems. But if we can get a good EU regulation going, I think that's a good start. And then, I mean, with all of these other countries, I think it's, it's a genuinely hard yeah. problem. But as long as, well, so it, it depends on what the regulation would look like, right? So. Uh, I think there is always going to be bad actors. Uh, the best we can, I mean, all we can hope for is to do as best we, as we can and then try to put pressure. And if they, I mean, if they are doing genuinely bad things, we can imagine things like sanctions or things like this to mm. put pressure. But I think that's way, way, way down the line. And we have to imagine very, very bad systems before going that far. Because, um, I mean, we all remember the, the, the childhood of internet where people talked about um, information wants to be free, that was sort of ev on everybody's lips. And, and the, the declaration of the inde um, independence of cyberspace from 1996, we by all remember that, right? By the grateful, the guitarist of the Grateful Dead, right? John Perry Barlow, yeah. yes, exactly. No, he was, was he the guitarist, the lyricist? Or a lyricist, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think so. No. Uh, but I, I mean, I remember that so well. I was in the in, uh, internet industry at that time, and we all had this very light view of what internet would be, and you know, empowering people and uh, against authoritarian states and so on. And, and now it seems to be the other way around. It was now, all taken over by the platforms, <laughs> the corporations. Yes, yeah. yes. And I mean, uh, the, the, the next uh, election in in US will probably be be AI campaigned a lot. I mean, it will be AI ca campaigns sort of running, running the business. Um, how, should we, how should we teach people to think critically about that? I mean, today we tell our children, remember that not everything you read on the internet is true, but soon we will have to tell them, remember that almost everything you read on the internet is false. <laughs> it, it's not really what we hoped for, is it? I think we're underestimating the, you know, the capability of the next generation to be to develop that kind of literacy. Uh, the, Do you think the, so? Uh, the cr critical towards sources and uh, on the internet, they they deal with social media to to some extent. And uh, and yes, there is there um, there are new challenges appearing uh, with uh, all sorts of various deep fakes that are appearing. But uh, but I think the uh, there will be. The development of that kind of, just as we have a visual literacy that's developing in my field, uh, we will have AI literacy as well. I think yeah, deep fakes have been around, you know, fakes of different kinds have been around for a long time, and even quite sophisticated ones have been around for a while. And it's interesting, I think people, you know, people do get taken in, but I think people have also developed a sense of when something is likely to be a fake. If it's coming from these sources on social media, well, great, just don't take it too seriously. Maybe if it appears on this reliable news site, then that's something you can take seriously. I agree that mm. critical thinking is, is very important, but I don't think it's, uh, you know, I think you, people can take philosophy classes in critical thinking where we, <laughs> where, we, uh, where we think about this stuff, but I think people will get used to knowing when, develop, develop a sense of when you can trust something and when you can't. It's just gonna be so central. These deep fakes are gonna be so central in all of our lives. I think it's gonna become second nature after a while. Don't trust that, it's the mm. unreliable source. But will we sort of go back to this printed morning paper from a, a re reliable media house, and that's the only thing we can trust? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Certain websites, maybe. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, when it comes to the social aspect of this, do you think that sort of a wide-scale adoption of VR and AI will, will change social interactions for the next generation. What, what, what do you think? People are already, you know, those people are already falling in love with their, uh, their AI bots. Yeah. What's this, uh, this replica? You can get your very own, uh, very own replica to interact with and maybe, uh, 
maybe fall in love with. I gather they, they turned off the special flirtation mode in, in Replica that disappointed many people. But uh, yeah, movies like uh, Her are now starting to, uh, starting yeah. to, to come to in life. In Japan, and, you can yeah. even get married with this digital person on the screen. I saw that in a TV program. If it wasn't fake news, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> For now, I don't think Replica is conscious. So I think this is probably a case of, of, of imputing, say, consciousness and mm. mentality to a creature that doesn't have it. But as the AI gets better and better, who's to say that 20 years from now we might, we might have actually human-level conscious AI, which, you know, for some people, the companionship can be valuable. But, mm. you know, you, don't want it, you want this to be done, again, you know, knowingly. If someone, say, falls in love with a... Uh, computer program, and it turns out the whole time to have been a philosophical zombie, well, there's something rather tragic about that. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Hendrik, what do you think? Will it change our social interactions in a profound way? Uh, yes, I do believe so, just as, I mean, the introduction of all kinds of technology changes, inter I mean, the telephone, uh, kind of FaceTiming, all, all of these kinds of things, of course, changes things. The interesting and hard question is how it will change things, and I think that is genuinely hard to predict. I think as we're kind of, well, I think two different things. So the kind of VR interactions, if they become as good as, you know, if it genuinely is like sitting in a room with your friends, and when you have the, I mean, the Facebook, the company formerly known as Facebook's uh, version of it clearly isn't like this, right? It looks like a a very old computer game from like the... But I'm, if it, I'm counting on Apple to get it right. Well, it says they're going after the social market with their new headset, so we'll, we'll see. Let's hope so, because... We'll see soon, yeah. yeah. Three weeks or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so if it, if it becomes like, if, if this could have just as it, like, if this could have been virtual reality, I think that would fundamentally change how we, how we behave. Otherwise, it would just be incremental, small steps. Maybe we'll go out a little less and, you know, spend more time with these things. But if it would be like this, I think very few people... Well, because then you could just hang out from the comfort of your home, and this is what probably people would do. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's hope. I think there's hope for humans in, in the sense that uh, interactions with virtual systems is going to be generally available and very cheap. So it's going to be a luxury to actually have the human interaction, and I think we will cherish that, and we will really enjoy when we meet IRL. So, so I think there's going to be room for human-human interaction in the future as well. I would say IPL in physical <laughs> life. Right. <laughs> IVL in virtual life. Right. But what about, uh, uh, what about the issue of um, uh, AI's, AI algorithms being biased? I mean, I, I read something that we had this system that... I, I don't remember what it was, but but it, it was biased towards racism, for example, because mm. it had been training on a lot of data that had that kind of tendency, so the system became racist. I mean, if, you, if, if, if authorities or companies start to use algorithms when they uh, sort of look at job applications, for example, how do you ensure that it doesn't fall into those bias issues? Yeah, I think that is one of the... So that's usually those systems are predictive AI systems as opposed to generative. So they take a bunch of data and then they predict, they give you a kind of score. Will you... Uh, so, I mean, the classic example of racism in, in these things is... Um, just like It's a program called Compass. It's about assessing the risk of recidivism for people who are kind of... Uh, kind of they uh, are... Like the suspicion is that they've committed a crime and then they're going to kind of predict if this person is going to c commit another crime. And that, that system turned out to be extremely racist. So uh, black defendants got a much higher risk score than white defendants and, and these kinds of things. So that's obviously extremely concerning. And I think the, this becomes even more concerning when it's often the case that when these systems are deployed, their kind of outputs are very, very, it looks like a factual output, right? So it just gives you a score. Yes, this person is likely to uh, recidivate. And the worry then is that people, because we're just people, we're going to see this output and say, oh, it, this is the truth because the machine told me so, and then we're going to kind of uh, follow its advice. Uh, and the worry is that we have these incredibly biased systems, and often without, uh, so they kind of, the, the people who are uh, subjected to these systems 
often don't have any recourse. So there's often no way of complaining. There's no way of trying to get a human to overturn it. I think there was a case in France. Uh, they had a system like this with welfare payments or something like this. And both the kind of bureaucrat and the person they saw, they both could see like these are obvious errors in the system, but there was no way of kind of overturning it because of the trust. I think there's a kind of big worry about trusting these systems too much because they give the impression of being objective, impartial, neutral, and these kinds of, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and we have a huge problem. Uh, more and more training of AI algorithms is done using synthetic data. So you actually generate data. You're not taking data from the real world. So you have an algorithm or even an AI system that's generating data. And the bias that you have in that synthetic data is then reinforcing itself. So we have to be very, very careful oh, when yeah. we design synthetic data. And those biases that Henrik's talking about is sometimes originating from the fact that we are ourselves generating fake data that we're putting into the systems as well. Uh, and that's a huge research domain in, in that area. That's super important. And I mean, even without kind of this, so Amazon, the company, they, had a, they wanted to hire new people and they, had a, they built an algorithm for assessing CVs. And then they just took, looked at all the people working for Amazon, took their CVs and they, they, they decided, oh, we want people like this because they're obviously they're succeeding at Amazon. And it turns out that a significant proportion of the people in technical roles at Amazon, they're men. And so people, even if you had the kind of on your CV, it said part of the women's chess club or something like this then they would be get given a lower score because no one else at Amazon had been part of the women's chess club. So yeah. I think we have to be very careful with these kinds of systems because yeah. they pick up these correlations that obviously aren't the correlations that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. David, from, a philosophical, from your view, philosophical view, I mean, who is responsible for a decision that is made by an uh, AI? <clears throat> right now, I think it's <coughs> primarily the creators of the, uh, of the AI system Sometimes the user, uh, sometimes you know, with these language models, a user can manipulate it in in different ways, and you know, you can bring out, for example, many of these systems are kind of, you know, just you train in that uh, language model, and maybe it's got natural biases because it's trained on all this biased and racist text. Then the companies try very hard to uh, to uh, to do what's called reinforcement learning through human feedback to try and improve their responses and make them less biased and less racist, but still they can be manipulated in certain ways so those, uh, so those biases come out. So I think users carry some responsibility, but obviously I think the primary locus right now has to be the people who build the models, have to build them in responsible ways. But as the systems get better and more sophisticated, eventually a time will come when we're going to have to hold the systems responsible. I don't think it's the case yet. We don't really hold, because we don't regard the systems, AI systems, as conscious beings or as agents, as beings with free will. We don't, we don't ever hold them directly responsible, except maybe in a mechanical way. Oh, it did this. We have, to, we have to fix it. But as it gets to the point in a decade or two where these beings start to look more and more as if they're conscious and agents, we're probably going to have to develop a whole new category of responsibility for recognizing these systems as responsible. And I mean, that has precedence in the law. For example, at a certain point, we started holding corporations responsible, when previously we just held individuals mm. responsible. There's a whole, came to be a whole new era of law for, area of law for holding corporations responsible. And I think mm. eventually, we're going to have to do the same for so, yeah. AI systems. Because I'm thinking, I mean, already now we have to deal with, uh, for example, self-driving cars. That is quite soon. Uh, a common thing. Uh, I mean, we have to decide what kind of ethics you should program into that car, because should it be a utilitarian ethics, for example? To, to, should the car minimize human damage in every situation, for example? Say that it's driving on a bridge and, and it has to choose, by, choose between uh, driving over a whole family or drive over, uh, down into the water and just kill the passenger. Uh, you saved five people, killed one. No one will travel with that kind of car, of course. I mean, how to deal with that? So I think the way, so I live in, I live in San Francisco, and to my surprise, so I didn't know this before coming there, but there are, the streets are filled with self-driving cars there. So basically, every 10th car or something is self-driving. It's, it's it's, it, it really is 
crazy. And you can even, you can even get a self-driving taxi there now. So they're already being deployed at, at a somewhat large scale. And what uh, ethics is programmed yeah, so into what, them? I think what they're doing is that they're just training them. So they, they aren't really programming ethics into them. So I think they have quite sophisticated machine learning systems. So they're just practicing a lot to try to make them safe and predict the kind of safe behavior. But the problem with this is that, I mean, so there was, I think Uber had a trial with a self-driving car and it, uh, it uh, collided with a, with a pedestrian who unfortunately died. And I think the yeah. reason for this was that they had assumed that pedestrian would pedestrians would always cross uh, the road at uh, crossings. So, and th this person didn't, and, <laughs> and, the, and the, the car was like, what is going on? What is this object in the road? There should be the only cars there. So this in combination with the fact that this human was leading their bicycle, so they wasn't uh, kind of riding on it. And the car was like, is this a bicycle? Is this a person? Is this a bicycle? Is and they got kind of some kind of overload, and it, it crashed. <laughs> So I think these Stack kinds of... Stack overflow. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, so this is the worry, right? That, that was also a case where there was an operator for the car that was not paying full attention, uh, so uh, exactly responsibility right. is distributed here somehow over yeah. the corporation, the operator. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe not the car yet. But that's coming. Okay, a final question before the break. Uh, that actually in a little way leads into the discussion after the break. Um, have, you, have you seen the cinema movie Megan right now? Uh, you have seen it? You have not seen it? Don't Maybe it some away. in the audience has seen it. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll give you the brief story here. It's, it's about a, um, a like 10 year old girl who has this very tragic accident. Both her parents are killed in a car accident. So she moves in with uh, her mother's sister, and uh, she is working uh, developing robots. And so she gets this young girl a robot to, uh, to keep her company, and that is Megan. And, um, she, she looks like a little girl as well, but she's an AI. And she's programmed with the goal of making sure that the, the re-human girl doesn't get hurt physically or mentally, emotionally. And that sounds wonderful. The problem is <laughs> it, 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 the methods she's using. She protects this young girl to every cost. And obviously that becomes, uh, it's a horror movie actually. <laughs> Um, you should see it. It's, it's really good. It's basically a it's basically a very dark version of Ishiguro's uh, Clara and the Sun, mm. right? Yes, so yes, which, it is. Which yes. is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So my question is, uh, we, we skip the question where whether they are conscious or not. But if we can imagine a very sophisticated AI that you can program with a certain goal, how do we make sure that? the AI doesn't use every mean, even the really dangerous means, to achieve that goal. It's Isaac Asimov's robotics laws in a way, but I mean, yeah. He also wrote a couple of novels where it, they didn't work, these robot laws. What do you yeah, think I mean, about People this? call this the problem of alignment, right? Yes. Aligning what the AIs do with human interests. And it turns out this is very difficult. Um, you know, at the very least, you want to make sure that the AI doesn't pursue any goals monomaniacally, like just protect this person. Um, the classic example is from Bostrom is the AI that just wants to create paper clips and will yeah. do it. <coughs> anyway, anything gets in the way of creating paper clips. Sorry, human beings, you're taking up space that can be taken up by, by paper, clips. paper clips. At the very <laughs> least, you want to give an AI system sensible goals where those goals are not monomaniacal, but include things like you know making sure that all humans are treated okay and remain autonomous and so on. But it's very, very difficult to program that into an AI system. We're not yet at the point where AI systems are powerful enough that, you know, I think this gets particularly problematic once you get to the point where AI systems are actually better at achieving their goals, more intelligent than humans, and thereby better at achieving their goals. Everything at that point is going to depend on how AI goals are specified and yeah and you can imagine okay you need to build in a whole lot of you know constraints like not interfering with the autonomy with autonomy of people but it's very very hard to formalize that yeah in an yeah, ai system this I mean. is why a lot of people right now are saying we need to go very slow on ai even jeff hinton one of the uh, one of the gurus of contemporary artificial intelligence said he's very worried about what happens once the ai yeah. systems reach human-level intelligence, and there's just not an obvious solution. There's no formula 
you can uh, you can put in the guarantee is that the AI systems but we already have the sort of the problem of the black box as I understand it that the programmers doesn't know how chat GPT-4 actually produces their answers as uh, uh, once there's machine learning it gets even worse actually because you train them on a bunch of cases yeah. and you rely it to gem you rely on it to generalize to new cases well if you program your morality in from cases Who's to say how it's going to generalize to far future cases? I read somewhere that the, pro the developers of, of ChatGPT4 did not expect it to be so good at writing computer code as it is. Uh, it obviously is fantastically good to, write, to, to, to produce computer code. I talked to a friend of mine who's a developer, a software development, he said he, it, it, what took him three days now takes him three hours because ChatGPT produces the, most of the stuff and then he just has to fine-tune it, basically. Uh, wh what I'm trying to say is that it seems that we already have these emergent phenomena uh, that nobody really understands how they can achieve. Um, Henrik and Anders, what's your thoughts I, about I think that? it's pretty hopeless. Uh, Sorry? <laughs> I think it's pretty hopeless in terms of actually accomplishing that, because we're not consistent ourselves, right? No. We, we, we take different decisions to and uh, talk about the trolley problem. Uh, and uh, you know the brain is struggling. Different parts of the brain has different decisions, and who wins in certain contexts. And it's it's it, it's that lacking contextual awareness uh, and the cultural encoding that we carry with us that forms our rational decisions. Uh, it, what seems perfectly rational to one individual may seem irrational to another one, depending on wh which perspective you have on a particular situation. And to transfer that complexity to an AI system, uh, I think is a, is a mega challenge and, mm. and it will require a long, long time before we actually get to that point. Mm. Uh, and not to mention all of these issues that we talk about with the liability, how we are transfer that to, uh, to the machines. And, and you know, we, we're, we're, we're quite forgiving when it comes to human error, uh, but we're not so forgiving when it comes to machine error. Mm. And you know, we can take errors in airplanes that ground a whole fleet of airplanes where mm. as a pilot makes a mistake and we say, oh, it's just human error, right? Mm. So, so we're very forgiving uh, when it comes to humans, but on the machine level to prevent those absurdities like you're talking about in the movie, I think we have a long ways to go. Hendrik, you got the final word here. Well, so I think in the near term, the way I think the EU thinks about it is that we always, for high stakes decision, there needs to be a human being in the loop. But of course, quite soon, that might not be feasible. And then I, I just, I mean, to echo what's been said, I think it's a, people have thought really hard about it. I still haven't seen like a convincing account of precisely how to do it. So maybe the answer is to try to not build these systems so quickly, move more incrementally, and hope that there is a way of, of aligning the values down the line. But I'm not sure what it would look like. OK, extremely interesting. We could talk much more about this, of course, but we have to take a break, break now for 20 minutes. Uh, I say thank you to Hendrik and Anders very much. David will come back in next uh, in 20 minutes. So take the chance now to get David's book out in the break out there, because there will be a book signing afterwards. See you in 20 minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Erik Söderlind. Tack. Underbart. Ja, jag önskar att jag kunde spela gitarr på det här sättet. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, and welcome back, of course. I hope you got something to drink and maybe a book out there. Uh, now it's thank you. Now it's time to focus on the philosophy of mind and the discussion about whether an AI could become conscious and self-aware or not. Please David, come up on stage again. Take your seat and yes. And I also like to invite two new guests uh, for this panel discussion. First, uh, she is the Pro Futura Fellow and Assistant Professor at the Department of Psychology and Linguistics at Stockholm University. Among other things, other things she, she uses brain imaging to investigate human-robot conversations. Please welcome Julia Udien. <laughs> Please sit down. And I also like to invite the Chief Research and Development Officer at Spotify. He has the CPO and CTO responsibility overseeing the product design, data and engineering teams at Spotify and, re and responsible for Spotify Spotify's product strategy. Please welcome Gustav Söderström. <laughs> okay, now we're going into the really deep questions of this evening. Uh, David, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you use Thomas Nagel's definition of consciousness, uh, the, the feeling of what it's like to be something or someone. Uh, so the, the first question is, of course, will AI, what do you think, will AI develop a consciousness with the feeling of what it's like to be an AI in our lifetime. David, yeah. you start. Yeah, so Thomas Nagel, who's my, still my colleague at New York University, wrote a famous article in 1974 called What is it like to be a bat? Yeah, exactly. And the idea is we really don't know what it's like to be a bat using sonar to get around. Is it more like hearing? Is it more like seeing? But presumably, there's something it's like to be a bat, and that's to say that you know, a bat is conscious. A being is conscious if there's something it's like to be that system from the first-person perspective. Most people would say there's nothing it's like to be this water glass. The water glass doesn't have a first-person perspective. So that's a way of saying the water glass is not Conscious. Consciousness in the sense of subjective experience mm. goes with there's something it's like to be you. So yeah, then the question then for AI is, well, first of all, you know, is there something it's like to be chat GPT you know, when it's answering questions? And if not now, could there be something it's like to be a to be chat GPT in the future? If I had to bet. I would guess that current language models are probably not conscious. So there's probably nothing it's like to be ChatGPT. Though I don't know. I've had some pretty good conversations with <laughs> ChatGPT, and sometimes I sometimes I wonder. Um, that said, I don't see any principled obstacle to an AI system being conscious. I don't think they're just going to develop. They're developing so fast now. I think so. If they're not conscious now, I'd say, well, within whose lifetime exactly? <laughs> well, okay. okay. Give, us, give, give us another 25 yeah, years or so. 50, sure. Within 50 years. 50 years. I think, yeah, much more likely than not within, within 50 years, maybe even, maybe even within 20 years. Okay, 10 years, that, who knows? That's, that's your take. Julia? Uh, I am a little bit more skeptical. Uh, and I mean, you can take these, this question at different levels. And uh, so, so that was actually uh, one of, of the things that I wanted to <coughs> comment on your keynote, that, um, you know, as a, so w we need to have a certain humbleness 
about how much we know about, for instance, the brain, if we want to replace neuron by neuron uh, the brain. So, so uh, actually, I, I, I often think of about, uh, about a thought experiment that I might attribute to you, I'm not sure, you tell me, but, uh, but if you put yourself in the position where you're the one who has to take the decision to turn off all the biological consciousnesses that we definitely assume are real, so the human consciousnesses, in favor of these, let's say, an uploaded consciousness. If you put yourself in the shoes of taking that decision, then I think that puts the question at the right, right level. Uh, because it, it's only if you would actually feel comfortable with taking that decision, turning off the biological consciousness that we actually have put the bar on the right level for what we mean with consciousness so, and this, this, the actual subjective experience that we're, we're interested in, no? Are we making this decision just for ourselves? Turn off our own brain and upload it, or are we doing this for well? Many actually, other it, it could be it would be both. I'm, I'm I was thinking of the version with uh, with turning it off for, for all. So I would yeah. argue that if the uploading is done in a gradual way, you know, gradually replacing the neurons by silicon chips, I would be willing to, and, and if the technology was good enough, I would eventually be willing to uh, volunteer. For this, mm -hmm. we don't have it yet, mm -hmm. but you know, could, mm -hmm. you could actually you could replace five or ten percent of the brain first and see how it's going. And see, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> still here, still here. Actually, I have mm -hmm. a diagram in the in the book of the Su the philosopher Susan Schneider undergoing uploading, and half her brain is uploaded, and there's a little thought bubble saying, "I'm still here." So mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe that would be a way to do it safely. Yeah, wiping out the whole brain and replacing by an upload. I would think even if that upload was conscious, I would still worry. Would it be me? Maybe I, I would have. Maybe that would have been like creating a clone of me or a twin of me. Great for them, not so great for me. No, so because because your your conscious experience is continuous, right? So there's the, mm -hmm. that continuity which is important. In the gradual case, yes. But in the case where I was the other case, where you just wipe out my brain, create a duplicate of my brain directly over there, and then wipe out. Wipe out my brain. Then yeah, and not that the same I kind would never do, for I sure. See. I would never do that. And so, so in that sense, I'm skeptical. Going back to perhaps biological realism, or okay, every, 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 every time you watch Star Trek, that, that is happening. You know, every time they step in the teleporter, they're creating a duplicate of yeah, them down yeah. on the planet, whole new person. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. But that's that's a famous uh, thought experiment by Derek Parfit, saying that if you could sort of go into a teleporting machine and you could be rebuild yourself atom by atom on Mars, completely rebuild yourself on Mars, would you, be accept, would you accept to do that? And then he says in this thought experiment, imagine that you go into this teleporting machine on Earth, and uh, then someone opens the door and says, you are actually teleported to Mars now, we rebuilt it on Mars, but the destruction process here on Earth didn't really work out well, so now we have to kill you. <laughs> Would you feel Sorry. comfortable with that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Gustav, what's your take on this, this question? Yeah, so, so, so my take is, is, rather than asking the question why, why it could become conscious, I think the, the more scientific question based on history is, is why not? Mm. And I think, Historically, we've ascribed sort of m magic to everything that wasn't science yet, uh, you know, to, to life until we started to understand how that worked and DNA and so forth, to uh, nuclear fission, etc. cetera, and, and, and recently to, to intelligence. And now that starts to become less and less magic and look more and more like science. So my question would be why con well, consciousness could be the one separate problem. It is something completely different. But I don't think the evidence necessarily points to that. I think we should be more skeptical and say, why wouldn't it also just be science? Mm. So if we do the exact same things, why wouldn't we get the same thing? Yeah, OK. Because, uh, I mean, s some philosophers in, in the philosophy of mind, at least, we're going to get back to that, boy, what you think. But some uh, thinks that uh, consciousness is an emergent phenomena, sort of. Uh, they, are, they have a reductionist view on, on this. And I read somewhere that ChatGPT3 has 
75 billion parameters, right? That can be adjusted. ChatGPT4 has around 1 trillion parameters, and the human brain has 100 trillion parameters. Is that correct? Something like that. Yeah, okay. So, so the, the, the scaling is just from 1 to 100, actually. That would probably quite soon be achievable, right? So why couldn't consciousness be an emergent phenomena that comes to chat GPT X when they have the same complexity as the brain? What's, what's your answer to that, David? I certainly don't rule it out. I mean, but these language models are very interesting because in some ways they're very human-like. They're trained on so much human data and human text that so they behave in these very human-like way. And to that extent, they replicate a human psychology. But if you look at what's under the hood, at what's inside, it's so very different from what goes on inside a human brain. Um, you know, these are these largely feed-forward systems that, that don't have anything like, at least the standard versions, don't have anything like perception. The human brain is built on a base of perception and the body and then language, I mean, thought and language, come much later and are built on top of that. A language model is such a totally different architecture. It's all this text processing without the underlying level of perception and a body. But now, there, there are don't, multi and don't forget the motor system. Yeah, that's yeah. the body. I mean, yeah. The, yeah, the, the motor body. system. The yeah. motor system, yeah. the agency. Yeah. I, think, I think that is, has, it's a little bit forgotten in the debate. It was brought up in the first panel, but you know, so, so I think we should talk both about consciousness, with consciousness arri arise in these language models, but also agency mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and this uh, intentionality. That basically. is the biggest thing. When I wrote an article about this, to give, I gave a talk at the NeurIPS conference last year, the biggest conference on AI about whether these language models are conscious. And the biggest obstacle right now, I think, is agency, unified agency in particular. These what, models, what is that? Don't, they don't seem to have a single persona a set of goals that are fundamentally driving and motivating them will accept this thing of predicting the next word. You can, I mean, they're very, they're chameleonic. They can take on a persona. They can take on a different persona. There seems to be sometimes, it's as if there's multiple beings, potentially within any given language model. What I would like to see is, yeah, a unified being with a single set of goals and so on. It has to have an ego. But, but I mean, <clears throat> Gustav, I know that at Spotify you're looking a lot into artificial intelligence. You have this uh, DJ voice, for example, who is not lo launched in Sweden yet, but I think some, some other countries. I have it on my mobile phone and it's extremely annoying. Uh, uh, <laughs> it sounds like an American DJ on speed, but it sounds like, like a real human. You can't tell that it is a computer synthesized voice. Uh, my question to you is, uh, these bodily sensations, perceptions, wouldn't it be quite easy to connect uh, an AI model to um, visual input, to uh, audio input? I mean, your, your DJ it listens to what songs I have in my playlist already. Yeah, I think the, the two things are interesting here. I, I don't really um, see the challenge, and to your point, to connect one of these systems to a continuous camera feed input, it, it takes that, classifies it, tries to achieve some objective, and then feeds that into itself. And then I think recurrence is, is necessary. And then you have something that if it has a goal to navigate somewhere, it has agency. The agency may have been put in there, but the agency may have been put into us as well, you know, procreation, etc. So I, I don't really see the problem in, in that. I, I do think, I have a view on this multimodality. Uh, people say you need homeostasis, you need uh, perception and so forth. But what the science seems to show is that what is really interesting is when you train these large language models just on text, they, they create these representations, these uh, vectors. They're, they're about a thousand numbers long that represent mm. different numbers that describe something. So if you take, for example, the color yellow, and, and you look at this, and then you take the color Orange, for example, it should be quite close to yellow. It, it is actually close in this vector space, even though it never saw yellow. So it seems to be able to build representations about things that it can't see just from text. You could argue that that representation, it could have learned it faster if it also had vision, maybe more accurate, but it doesn't seem 
like you need to, to have these senses. I mean, blind people seem to create representations of the world just fine, even if you're blind from birth. So the way it's looking right now, my bet would be you can build a world model just from text. You probably need more data and training examples because it's harder than if you also had it, but I don't think there's this that one sensor and then boom, it's going to be conscious. I don't, it doesn't seem like that's the problem. It seems like there's some fundamental principle of intelligence that we discovered somehow, which looks maybe more like flight. When the birds did it, it looked really hard, but once we figure out the principle of flight, it wasn't that difficult, and we could actually scale it and do it much faster than birds, still not as energy efficiently, but actually much faster. Maybe that's where we are with intelligence, not yet consciousness. It's unclear if this would lead, would lead to consciousness. Mm. <clears throat> but do you think, I mean, <clears throat> we talked earlier about that chat GPT-4 already writes computer code very much better than anyone expected. Will we soon come to the point where, where chat GPT-4 can rewrite its own code to be better? I mean, if you have this recursive process where, where the AI improves itself or creates a replica of itself that is better than the previous one, and that one creates a new replica, and so on, in a very fast speed. I mean, how, how do you think about people that? Are, people are already working on using AI systems to fine-tune the parameters in AI systems and then see you know, exactly what you want to be the distribution of these kinds of attention heads and so on. So there's a little bit of use of AI for fine tuning. But I think right now, actually, but the biggest constraints on these language models doesn't actually seem to be their architecture. It's something like the amount of computational power which is available and the amount of data which is available for them to be, uh, for them to be tuned on. So what we really need is a, uh, is a language model which gets so smart it can actually come up with better and faster chips, um, you know, successes of the graphics processing units that they currently yeah. run on that work much, uh, work much faster. But that's, a, uh, but that's further in the, uh, that's but further in the but future. But soon we have quantum computers. Yeah, well, we don't, we don't know how soon. I'm counting on these AI <laughs> systems to really help us with all these things eventually. But um, it's probably... They're going to have to, it's once they reach the point of human level intelligence, then a little while later they get to the point of greater than human level intelligence, and then they'll be better at all these things than us, maybe at building chips, at building quantum computers, and so on. We're not there yet, though. Right now we're at the level of somewhat below human level intelligence, which means that the advantage that you get from AI developing AI. Except when small. it comes to spe special tasks like yeah. playing chess, for example, because it's obviously much better than any human. It's true, yeah, it's better. But, but I think it's, it's still, we have to see that there is a limitation at that there, it's still trained on one task, which is to predict the next word. That's what the language models are doing. Mm -hmm. And that's a very limited task. Like from the, so uh, what I do uh, as, a, as a scientist is to to uh, understand the underlying processes of, for instance, producing speech. And there's, there are theories that this kind of prediction is what we do when we produce speech, but most people in this field would say that that's not all that we do, that's part of what we do, but there are also additional uh, language processes which are not about prediction. And I think that, that's like the best model that we have from the science so far, so then we should you know, increase with different tasks for the AI to do. So I would, uh, this is something I would question. I think this is what's kind of shocking the field, that it's, if, if you take, you know, a few trillion pieces of text on the internet and you hide a character from yourself and guess that, turns out then you get good at guessing the next word. If you can get the, guess the next word, you're pretty good at guessing the next sentence. If you can guess the next sentence, pretty good next paragraph, next paragraph, next page, next one research paper, next, re no one thought that it was just, it's just going to abstract and abstract. And that's what seems to be happening. And so I think a lot of people are a bit offended because it puts up a mirror to ourself. Mm -hmm. Because it says, like, but I can't possibly be that simple, right? There and I think that's what upsets people, that maybe it is that simple. Back to the analogy of flight. It looked incredibly complex when this bird flapped, but when we figured out the equation for flight, it was tremendously... Maybe it actually gets easier when you understand it, not harder. And the shock of the last few years is that it maybe it was much easier than we thought. It's actually one of the leading theories of the human mind that's quite, been quite popular even before this resurgence in AI, which is that 
human brains are prediction machines. We're basically yeah. always trying to, exactly, and Andy Clark and others, mm -hmm. who are, uh, we're always constantly trying to predict the next input. And that's basically all that we're doing fundamentally is to, like predict the next thing we'll see. And it, but it turns out in order to do that, you've got to build very sophisticated models of the, of the world with reasoning and so on. It's all in service of predicting the next input. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, none of those ever people thought that it would suffice just to predict the next word. That's, that's, exactly. that's the surprising, it turns out you don't actually need even to predict the next visual input. You just do it all at the level of language, yeah. predict the next word. And as a result of that, you get all these amazing emergent capacities. I don't think anyone saw that coming. And there is another um, potential key there that a lot of people have, have thought for a long time that maybe intelligence is to some extent just compression. And the other things that these models, models are forced to do is they're forced to take a huge amount of numbers and those numbers could be words represented by numbers or pixels, and they are forced to represent them with just a few numbers. And if you take something big and you need to represent it with much less, you have to, in some sense, understand it well. This is what it, you know, if you want to teach some, something to someone, you're most forced to understand it. You have to internalize it. So, so maybe th those two processes, uh, having to compress information and having to, to do that while predicting the next word is enough. It's enough, but the question is, what are we trying to do? And so here I th I'm trying to look at the next horizon. Where, where should we go? And I'd like to put the human back in there, you know, because uh, we're humans and we should ask also questions about ourselves. How is this going to be used for ourselves? So, so then I think, um, um, sorry, lo lost the thread here. What, what was the last thing that you said? Humans need to keep existing. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> they Which do. I agree with. We we'll try to do that. Yes, so, like, so I, I can agree with your enthusiasm about this particular task as well, to predict the next word. Because when we're taking that model of what, what, what it means to produce language and then use that model to investigate the brain, then we're getting very interesting results. So. Um, uh, this is what I think needs to be done as the next horizon, to use all this insight from the AI and then going back to understanding biology. So uh, it used to, like, historically it was the case that AI was uh, um, inspired by neural networks. That, that's how it all started off. But now, it, now we should close the loop and go back and look at biology again with all this technology. Then we will be able to solve problems that has been around for a long time about ourselves. So that's something I really agree with, and, and I wanted to ask you about this. I think there's, there's a chance here that we can have this field of sort of artificial neuroscience. We can understand things about our mind through this. So what are your thoughts on, is there any good test for consciousness for these machines? Could we actually detect it in some reasonable way? Because if we could, maybe we could try to understand our own consciousness. Yeah, tests for consciousness are, are difficult. I mean, there are some... With humans, we rely on a couple of things. First thing we rely on with humans is verbal report. If someone says they're conscious of something, we normally, we normally, ex we normally take their word for it unless there's some reason to doubt it. So we use report as a guide to consciousness. But that doesn't work nearly so well for these language models because they're trained on all this human text, which includes text of people saying, hey, I'm conscious and so on. So of course you can, it's easy to get a language model to say I'm conscious, but does that mean anything? It means much less, it seems. We also have neural correlates of consciousness in the human case. There are certain kinds of neural activity that seem to correlate, but that also doesn't work for language models because they don't have neurons. <laughs> we have computational correlates of consciousness, theories of consciousness. Some people have argued that consciousness requires a certain kind of global workspace maybe a certain kind of recurrent processing. So I think actually the best angle on testing for, uh, for consciousness in a language model may be something like that. Take our best theories of consciousness and apply them. And if we build one with a global workspace or with a recurrent network, with recurrent networks, that's going to be at least a, a better sign. But it's very difficult. I mean, consciousness, but it's already controversial in animals or infants. You know, we can't measure it. We have no direct measure. But I, I, here I was thinking about, because you've been talking about the meta problem, mm -hmm. right? So uh, perhaps you should tell the audience what 
Yeah, right. what I call the meta problem of, well, I mean, there's the hard problem of consciousness, which is explain why brain processes give you subjective experience, which contrasts with the easy problems of explaining how it is we do various things, how it is we behave, and so on. But yeah, what in recent years I've been calling the meta problem is the problem of explaining why it is that we think and say there is a problem of consciousness. <laughs> I mean, just, if you catalog, if we I think this is great. Yeah. If you catalog this all our behavior, you know, I say a bunch of things, I say this, I do that. Well, one of the things that people say is, you know, I am conscious. I'm conscious of this. And, not, and at least some people, like me, say, consciousness is mysterious. Consciousness poses a hard problem. Interestingly, that's a bit of behavior that I produce. So in principle, that, explaining why I say that, is in principle one of the easy problems. Uh, in principle, there ought to be some neuroscience or a computational story about why it is we go around saying, I am conscious. Some people lead this to combine this with the view that actually consciousness is just an illusion. Like Daniel and, Dennett. Yeah, exactly. And he says, all you need to do is solve the meta problem, explain why we say I'm conscious, and then we can just dismiss it. Consciousness is not real, it's an, it's an illusion. And for various reasons, I find that impossible to believe. But, mm. um, but nonetheless, like the very fact, finding, but I still think solving the meta problem is a very important process. We find the mechanisms that generates these verbal reports but in us, that we can look for those in AI systems. So, so, yeah, and you can also just feed all those verbal reports cross-culturally, I think is important also. We don't mm -hmm. want just the Western cons consciousness. And uh, if we, you could feed that to the AI, then it would have the data that it needs to kind of figure out so what should the model of consciousness so be, like should it different kinds of consciousness, for instance, phenomenological and access consciousness and so forth. So there has been a test suggested, uh, which was um, basically you would take something like GPT-4 or something, and somehow, a bit theoretical, remove any discussion mm. of consciousness from the training data. So it would never have been trained on the words consciousness or discussed, very theoretical here. And then you would interrogate it, because unlike an animal, you can interrogate it. And you would ask it like, so, you feeling anything? <laughs> Is it like something to be, what do you think of that? <laughs> Very difficult to prepare the training data. Right. It's not just getting rid of every word mentioned. You, of the you word, can't be in any of that of training the word data. consciousness, but I mean, people talk about seeing and hearing and feeling. Are we going to get rid of all that? Are we going to get rid of any mental word at all that people believe things and want things? And so on? at a certain point, if we never mention the mind, I'd be very surprised if the AI ever mentions, ever starts talking about the mind. But if it does, I agree, that would be very, very impressive. Yeah. David, maybe we should <clears throat> explain a little bit to the audience what, what the hard problem is. I mean, you, the concept of subjective experience. Mm -hmm. You have this thought experiment with Mary. Mary is a neuroscientist who knows everything that is theoretically possibly possible to know about how you experience color, right? But Mary has grown up in a black and white room, uh, so she's never seen a color. And, um, and then one day someone opens the door and she sees a red rose. And the question is, does she actually gain new knowledge? Uh, most of us would say, yes, she has an experience which is, which is something new to her, even though she theoretically knew everything about how the brain processes colors. And that is the subjective experience, right? That is qualia, that's what you call qualia. Yeah, people, philosophers use the word qualia as a word for the qualitative character of experience, like the redness of red, the blueness of blue, the painfulness of pain. And it's, that's absolutely, that's, you know, when we talk about consciousness as subjective experience, so much of that seems to be this kind of qualitative yeah. character. And that also, yeah, you can, the thought experiment of Mary is a beautiful way of bringing this out. Because, yeah, from knowledge, just say we had a complete wiring diagram of the brain, then we could predict everything this system does everything the system is going to say. We could figure out what the, we know what the computational algorithms were. Mary, from in, Mary, who's inside the black and white room, she could you know, be the world's leading scientist of, of color, um, could know everything about what the brain does, but it still seems there's something she wouldn't know. And what she wouldn't know is what it's like to see red. What is yeah. the conscious experience <clears throat> of redness? And this is one way of bringing out the gap. There seems to be this gap between knowledge of the brain and knowledge of consciousness. And, and I think it's not just a gap, it's a hierarchy. 
I would mm -hmm. say, because it's the subjective experience that's the interesting stuff. You uh -huh. know, it's that, yeah. that's the level we want to work with. Mm -hmm. right? Subjective so, experience yeah. is what makes life worth living. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. it's a hierarchy. But, but Costa, <clears throat> do you think that qualia could be an emergent phenomena that would come about in chat GPT X a few years from now? <coughs> so, like I said, I don't see mm. if we do have qualia, depending on your worldview, if it's an illusion or not, but if we assume it's not, then I don't see why, mm. theoretically, why it couldn't. I think we should assume that it could for, for various reasons, just um, for, for moral reasons. If we happen to produce this without <coughs> realizing it, that could be tragic if, if they turn out to in have AI, quality. You mean? In AI, you In AI. Yeah. Uh, that, they could, that they did have qualia somehow. I don't have any explanation for how it would happen. I don't think anyone in the world does. No. But, but I don't see why not. And, and I think it's interesting to... So, so I think it is very reasonable that in the... Even in the simple case of just trying to predict the next... What is called the token, so maybe the next word, but also maybe the next pixel, etc. It will turn out that it's really useful for these models to model themselves because how do they explain that the pixels look that way? Well, it's because they moved. And if you model yourself as moving, so maybe you start to build some image of yourself or some model of yourself. It's, it, it is literally a hard question if that model suddenly has qualia, can't answer that. But it's reasonable that they would model themselves. And in fact, when you talk to these systems, I think they are modeling themselves. Because when you ask it, how are you feeling? It has to try to figure out what, what you is. And they say, I feel. so. They're already modeling themselves to some but, extent. But that's also something where is the next version that we need to, I mean, now it's a black box. We need to go into this black box. So what, what are the internal vari variables in the AI? The and, and then try to map that onto the best model that we have of how we work, how, yeah, how, how, how we work. That's yeah. why I think this artificial neuroscience is really interesting. There was a really interesting paper a few months ago where, where some scientists managed in one of these models to, to move the Eiffel Tower from Paris to Rome. And so the way they, they, they understood is what to interrogate the model afterwards. They said, you're standing in the Eiffel Tower and you're looking at what do you see? And it said, I see this piazza. And then they asked it, how do you get to the Eiffel Tower? And you take a train to Rome. So they're starting to understand at least how these models represent information. I think there's a lot to learn that we could take back to neuroscience. Yeah, that's a world model, and people have yeah, begun to decode elements of these systems. World models, like yeah, where is the Eiffel Tower? These units seem to be coding its location. I don't think we're yet to the level of having finding self-models <coughs> in these systems, no. which are anywhere near as sophisticated. But you're right, they're kind of beginning to be there. And eventually, I assume, we're going to have language models that have self-models that are at least roughly as sophisticated as human self-models, if only because they're trained on a whole lot of the right text expressing our self-model. So interest, well, part of the self, human self-model, though, is that we model ourselves as being conscious. So I assume that once, if we eventually have language models as to, with mo the dupe, that replicate human self-models, they will also model themselves as being conscious. So so yeah, but they conscious. could do that without being conscious. Yeah. That, is, yeah. that is the $64 yeah. exactly. million dollar question. Yeah. So they may mm. Does that mean they're conscious or not? Or is it yeah. merely a self-model? Maybe but these language models can end up being the way Dan Dennett thinks we are, namely just under the illusion that they're conscious, yeah. even though they're not. He was right all along. But I mean, <laughs> I must ask you this, because <clears throat> this is very interesting. I mean, we probably all agree that sooner or later, these AIs will behave in a way that will fool all of us to, to say that they behave like they are conscious, even if they are not. They will behave like they are conscious. We will still say, okay, of course they're not, but they're simulating it so well, so we can't distinguish it from a real person. They, they will pass the Turing test. Uh, if that is the case, that will mean that if and when they really get conscious, we will not know, because we've been fooled much earlier. It's, yeah, it's, this this is why see? I think the, the test is really important. And, mm -hmm. and I, I agree with you, that's why I asked. I think the interrogation is a, is a difficult test. But this is a moral problem. But, I mean. but if you can figure out through comparison to neuroscience that it's likely, then, then maybe you could at least have a better guess. And I think it's a moral problem but in, in two ways. Yeah. Everyone talks about the downside, that you know, we could create a lot of suffering and so forth. I, I think there's an interesting opposite moral problem which is, you talked about the, the travesty of the philosophical zombie. 
Like if, if everyone walks around as if they're aware but no one is home, that's a travesty, which kind of implies that the most important thing in the world is consciousness. Mm -hmm. So you could also argue that if you're an sort of effective altruist, the second we can create consciousness, you should take every dollar about minimum pay and just create consciousness. <laughs> that is the ultimate good. And I think there's some truth to that. If it is, maybe that is the point of the universe and then we have to create lots and lots of consciousness. What if all you could do is create mouse level consciousness? Should we then like create an infinite number of mouse level consciousness? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Feeling, feeling great? I mean, that, that, it has to be, yeah, it, it also has to be, the question is that how, what, what is, does it need to be like for that experience? It can't suffer, but how good does it have to be? Just like barely yeah, surviving that, or really comes, good? Sorry, that, so that comes back to this like, what is, what, what is it that we're trying to do? I mean, is it that we're trying to have a meaningful life? Can you build a meaningful life in VR? Was one of the questions mm -hmm. in your keynotes. But I would say that that's, that, that is perhaps like a little bit low ambition. Because then you get into these problems. Like, so then we create these, these mice with the, ah, they have a meaningful life, but ultimately it doesn't feel so, what, how does it help me, you know? Well, it's isn't like, that I, a little I, bit I egoistic? Like, I want to preserve the consciousness for myself. No, it's not that I want to preserve the consciousness for myself, but it's like, w my problem that I'm working on is to get rid of my suffering. You know, like suffering is a big word, but stress or whatever. You know, so that's what I'm working on. I think that I, perhaps all of us are working on that to some extent. You want to eliminate all suffering and then it will, yeah. be, a, then high, it will be a good high, life? High, high uh, ambition, like I, I want to have a high ambition. You know, why not? Why cross off the possibility sure. that like, I can I mean, get a rid bit of, of A little bit of frustration can go, you know, if all your projects work out automatically, then after a while it's not going to seem so meaningful, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not just a scientist, you know. Yeah. I, have, I have a life outside of science mm -hmm. as well, so... <laughs> a, little, I mean, a little frustration goes a long way. In yeah. over, you know, overcoming challenges is like an, awf an awful lot of where life gets its <coughs> meaning. Learning, right? learning is yeah. great. But, uh -huh. yeah. but really, I, I must go back to the, the question about consciousness and AI. I mean, I know, David, that you have... You're not a reductionist uh, in the way that I think Gustav is, at least. Uh, we'll hear about Julia, but Gustav, you're a reductionist in the sense that you think that consciousness is something that materializes in complex systems uh, under certain circumstances. I, I hope it does, because then it's interesting. If it's like baked in, it's like, okay, that was it. So I'm hoping that yeah, it is something that yeah, okay. Fair enough, fair enough. But David, you, you lean towards a more pa panpsychist view. Can, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, elaborate I've, on I've that argued in, in, uh, in actually my, way back in my first book, The Conscious Mind, 1996. Still not translated into Swedish, by the way. Mm, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I take the point. <laughs> I argued that, uh, in fact, consciousness can't be fully explained in terms of physical processes. Basically, the kind of explana explanations you'll get from physical processes will solve the easy problems yeah. of explaining behavior, but not the hard problem of subjective experience. So there I argued the best way to build a theory of consciousness is to accept that consciousness is a fundamental constituent of the universe, the same way that, you know, in physics, tip people typically take space and time, or space-time, mass, charge, as fundamental entities. It's okay to have some irreducible elements in your theory, and I argued that consciousness should be treated that way. So it's a part of a stone as well. Well, then, the, then you've got two alternatives, actually. Alternative one is dualism, which says you've got physical processes, you've got consciousness, which are at least distinct properties, and we have special laws connecting them. That needn't have the consequence that stones are conscious. That's mm -hmm. consistent with just humans being conscious. It all depends on what the psychophysical laws are okay. that connect the physical processes with consciousness. But the other alternative is panpsychism, that consciousness exists at the basis of all physical processes, kind of baked in to physics. Into I mean, the atom, in a sense, like charge. It's or like physics tells us all about the relations between, between things, about the structure of the physical world, but it doesn't say, uh, doesn't say anything about the intrinsic nature of, uh, of those things. People in the philosophy of science, James Ladyman, who's been here, um, calls this epistemological structural realism. All science tells us is about the structure of matter, not its intrinsic nature. What's well, a very natural speculation then. Physics tells us about 
the structure, but not the intrinsic nature. Where does consciousness fit in the world? Maybe the intrinsic nature of physics is actually consciousness. And that's what, it's a way out speculation, but that leads one to the idea that consciousness might be present at the basis of the physical world. Then the challenge is, how does all that consciousness in physics come together to produce the kind of consciousness we experience? Mm. And no one's actually solved that problem yet. So but but, 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 but if you choose between panpsychism pan and dualism, where is your take? 50-50. I'm splitting my bets. Okay. So, uh, uh, we had a That's dinner good. on Sunday, and, and you gave some statistics there. <laughs> so yeah. first of all, I, I love the notion that your worldview is probabilistic. I think that's very <laughs> clever. I think you said, uh, it was written down, 40% dualist, 40% panpsychist, 3% idealist, and 17% something else. Yeah. Right? Except so my, 3% was for illusionism. That illusionism. Was for, that was illusionism. for the Dandana view. Okay. 3%. So oh, what is yeah. illusionism? Yeah. That's the view that consciousness doesn't actually exist. Okay, that, that it's, that's it's, you, it's yeah. just that we think it exists. Okay, that, that, and yeah. it's not real. We're all just taken in by the meta problem. So my question then is, yeah. if you believe in um, that consciousness can at least emerge in these models, then it sounds is, is, is that the seventeen percent something else? Because then it is emergent, or is that compatible with dualism or panpsychism? Was this word emerge? emergent is such a kind of a murky, slippery <laughs> word? People use. Emergence is this, I, sometimes like it's like a magic word to make you feel better about <laughs> something you don't understand. <laughs> ah, it's emergent. So, it's a good word. When I wrote a paper on this, I said we've got to distinguish strong emergence from weak, weak emergence. emergence. Sorry, philosophers yeah. always <laughs> do this. We make, we, we do make you want distinctions. To separate those two? Weak, strong emergence is like something fundamentally new that you could never predict, even in principle, from the basis. Weak emergence is what you get in complex systems. Yeah, mm. it's. It's in principle predictable if you ran the simulation yeah. in enough detail but not and so on. It's just practically or yeah. psychologically difficult. Yes. So weak emergence is what you find in a lot of yeah, work on computation and so on. That's fine. But I think consciousness can't be weakly emergent. It would have to be strongly emergent. And if consciousness is strongly emergent, that's basically the, the view that... So weak emergence leads to, leads to materialism, but strong emergence tends to lead to dualism. Okay. Julia, what's your take on this? No, I'm, I, uh, I'm more with the dualist view, actually. But I, so I wanted to ask you about <coughs> if, if consciousness is this basic uh, property of the physical universe, how does the individual experience of consciousness, so how, how are the different selves individuated from each other in that, from that point of view? Yeah, I mean, this is a, one version, I guess, would you take like a Newtonian worldview and every particle has its own little bit of consciousness. It's like a micro-self. And somehow then those come together to yield our consciousness. That's what the combination problem that no one has a good answer to. But the other view you might have maybe suggested more by quantum mechanics where the universe actually has a single holistic state, a wave function, is the view that people call cosmopsychism. The cosmos as a whole... Um, has a state which is like the universal consciousness, and then our consciousnesses are aspects of the cosmic consciousness. And then the question is, how does that single cosmic consciousness somehow get differentiated into individual selves like ours? And there's actually no good solution to, to that one either. But people have put forward some ideas, like you know, we're all we're all that part of the cosmic consciousness, and somehow we only have access to a bit at a time. But solve that problem, and then we'd actually have a panpsychist theory of consciousness. Gustav? So you talked a bit about agency, which I mm, think is important. Mm. And you talked a bit about free will previously. And you said you would have loved to write a chapter on that. So one question I had in, in reading your book, uh, Reality Plus, was that if you, you talk about it from bit. So if you, we assume that you can simulate a world perfectly with just an ordinary but very powerful binary computer, then that world is completely deterministic because it's being played out in this binary computer. So these things then, do they actually have free will? Or is free will something only in the base level, but not in simulations? Or how do you think about that? Like, where does well, the agency come in? It all depends Quick on what answer. you mean by free will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's really deep questions. <laughs> free will in this, you know, the one sense of free will where it means being able to do something totally unpredictable and totally non-deterministic, maybe, uh, maybe nobody has that. You know? But maybe there are things worth calling free will that you can have even in a deterministic world. 
Like one very simple thing is just the ability to do what you want. Right? I think that's something we can have even if the world is deterministic. And maybe that's something worth calling freedom. Maybe it's not the big full notion of free will, which involves fundamental unpredictability. But this is a place where I agree with Dan Dennett. He wrote a book whose subtitle was The Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting. <laughs> uh, we have to, you know, what is it that we really care about when we care about free will? We care about moral responsibility and so on. And maybe that's a matter of having the right psychology. And we have to figure out you know, the kind of free will you could have in a deterministic world. Can I ask you, do you think that, we, we just have to end quite soon, but can I ask you, do you think that when, when, in a few years when we have an AI that is so, 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 sort of self-improving and learning and so on, do you think teaching that AI uh, to develop, do you think it will be something like um, te um, teaching a child, having a, taking care of a child that is growing up? Do you think it will be a similar process? Training an AI is, is like uh, teaching a child. Well, already every AI goes through a massive learning run on a whole bunch of data, way more data than any child uh, ever gets. Yeah, and it will you know, people do find some developmental stages in this uh, in this training process, but it doesn't look very much like anything that happens to a child. But there's also an evolutionary process that happens with AIs, which you know, we move from one from one system. We had GPT two. We got to GPT-3 and GPT-4, and mm. they evolve and they change mm. in all kinds of ways based on, well, we see what works in GPT-2 and move that forward to GPT-3 and so on. So maybe that's more like an evolutionary process mm. that perhaps would recapitulate something of development. I mean, these, these language models do feel like they're big children right now that are, <laughs> get, that are amazingly sophisticated at some things and terribly naive yeah. at, at other things. Yeah, so I thought the, the discussion on alignment in the previous panel was, was very interesting. And, and the notion that has been around is that you, you program as if you write code, you should do this in that situation. But, but these models always are statistically trained, so it's, it's probabilities. And to some extent, you could say that we have these unaligned, um, generally intelligent things walking around everywhere. It's us, it's our children and so forth. And how do we teach them to drive? Well, we, we force them to practice for a long while. We don't let them drive until they do certain things. So uh, to some extent, the problem has been solved. And it seems like that's at least an, a path. But that also Im implies that before this, you know, with, with teenagers, we, you don't really give them a lot of power before they're aligned. Maybe you shouldn't give them guns unless you live in the US <laughs> and so forth. So um, I, I think it's, um, it, that seems like the likely path to align them. But it also means that there is, there is actually good reason to be quite careful mm -hmm. uh, right now. Because the problem here is that this, if this is a teenager, it could be an incredibly powerful <laughs> teenager. Yeah. The Do point where they, receive, where they reach adulthood, you know, human level, full scale human level intelligence, that's a point where everything becomes suddenly very unpredictable. So I'm all in favor of slowing down. Julia? No, I mean, so comment on developmental aspect there, I'm thinking of one of the limits in AI right now, which is the short-term memory. Mm. So they don't, they can't have a big context out of which they can produce or predict this next word. Mm. And mm. I think that's very apparent with y when you interact with, with GPT, that uh, it, it's this short-term memory problem which, is, mm. which, which has to be solved. Mm. And to some extent that can be solved by just, you know, more computing power, mm. but I don't think that's going to be the way. I think that, again, going back to uh, cognitive science, uh, cognitive neuroscience, we will have to build in our best models which representations are working for the brain. Mm. That's going to be the way to uh, improve AI mm. in a more efficient way. So, so a little bit more sophistication rather than just you know, more <laughs> brute force. Okay, we, have <coughs> we soon have to finish this. Um, it's really interesting to hear your thoughts about it. Uh, before we finish, I just must tell uh, you, David, that I, I got this email from Doug Hofstadt yesterday, uh, our common intellectual mentor, uh, we could say. It's, it's quite, actually quite funny. We, we're almost the same age, and we read Gerdel Eschebach when we were teenagers, mm -hmm. both of us, and it completely changed our, 
our lives. And we both wrote a letter to Douglas saying that this book changed my life. What, what should I study? What should I do? Um, and uh, and uh, I got a reply and he gave me a lot of good advice, advice on what to study. And to, to you, you got a reply as well. And he said, come and work with me in my laboratory. <laughs> I still had to come over that. I still had to come over that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I got to work with him much later in life, though, so it's okay. But anyway, he wrote to me yesterday about this discussion. He said that, remember that the greatest miracle uh, in the history of Earth was when life itself emerged from non-life. That is... Uh, when inanimate matter gave rise to animate beings. Compared to that astonishing volcanic explosion a few billion years ago, the looming takeover of meaning, concepts, ideas, beliefs, thinking, sentience, and consciousness by computational entities from biological entities is just small potatoes. Just a minor blip in the steady march of evolution on the surface of planet planet Earth. It's quite well put, I think. <laughs> uh, I think there are some flowers for you. I want to thank you so much for taking part in this discussion. Um, my final question, do you think that AIs might in the future fall in love with each other? Yes. Why yes? Not? Why not? Julia? Uh. No. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> laughing at the question. <laughs> Can we ask um, Hendrik and uh, Anders to come up on stage as well, and Eric, if you're still here, because there will be some flowers. Thank you so much for tonight. <laughs> thank you, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. See you outside. Thank you so much. <laughs>